Okay, thank you for your patience. We're trying to get reacclimated to our regular boardroom here. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with item 3.1, which is the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, would Trustee Yehiro like to lead us, please? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, again, welcome everybody. And um, this is our first meeting since the beginning of the 1819 academic year. So we're really excited um, to have everybody back. And it was a little sparse in, at our board meetings over the summer, but that's okay. We had our directors here, which was great to see you, but nice to see some other folks too. Um, anyway, um, I am gonna go ahead and move on to item 3.3, superintendent's comments. Dr. Rodriguez? Yes. Well, along the same lines, welcome back to the 2018-19 school year. Um, we're proud of all the work that we've accomplished this past year, and we're looking forward to another great year of success for our, both our staff and students. So, bienvenidos al año escolar um, 2018-19. Estamos muy orgullosos de todo el trabajo que logramos um, el año pasado y esperamos otro gran año de éxito para nuestro personal y nuestros estudiantes. This year we have an anti-bullying campaign called Be a Kinder, More Empathetic You. And we'll be holding the kickoff day with students on September 26. And so we hope that you join in on the activities at the various school sites and throughout the year. So este año tenemos una campaña contra la intimidación llamada Sé un tú más amable, más empático, empático. Vamos a celebrar el día de inicio con los estudiantes el 26 de septiembre en todas las escuelas. So esperamos que, participe, que van a participar de las actividades ese día en las escuelas o los departamentos y durante todo el año. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And, um, we will move to board comments, but I also wanted to mention if anybody would like translation services, see our translator right over here, and um, she can outfit you with some um, earpieces. Um, and beyond that, I will, Willie, I'll go ahead and I'll start with Willie and go down this way. Yes. Solo queríamos informarles que tenemos traductoras si ocupan ese servicio. Wow, thank you very much. Um, we had a chance to uh, visit Red, uh, Radcliffe Elementary School, and I just want to mention, if, if you have an opportunity to go to Radcliffe School and just look at the fencing around the front, and for some reason, the fence brings the artwork right out very well. And, and uh, what really began as a safety project turned into an art Form. It is really nice and you should go see it. Uh, we also had a chance to go to the Amesti School right up the street. Looked at, looked at some of the work done there to uh, really begin to um, make that facility super safe. And so that they actually put in a nice uh, frontage road, a uh, drive-in for the buses, everything. And um, since uh, Victor walked in, we'll, we'll uh, give him recognition for the outstanding work, uh, not only Victor, but everyone that is associated with uh, facilities. You're doing a wonderful, wonderful job. And, and when I say we, my um, partner in crime has been uh, Bill Beecher, who is the chairman of the Bond Oversight Committee. So it's, um, it's, so it's uh, nice to see people that are involved with the supervision to make sure that the funds are, um, are uh, well spent and uh, making all of our uh, schools very, very nice. Bill, thank you. Um, sure, thank you. Uh, I got the opportunity to attend the district-wide um, breakfast maybe two weeks ago now, about two weeks. Um, and it was a fantastic turnout, so I was really happy to see a lot more staff present and returning staff, actually. 
Um, and in addition to that, I was um, able to volunteer at the Strawberry Festival for the Friends of Walton Hill Parks and Community Services. Uh, we were selling um, strawberry tamales, so that was a really fun event. I think that that's something that our Paro Valley Foundation um, should consider in the future. I think it's good publicity and a good source of um, funding. And I am looking forward to kicking off the GLAC meetings soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, like Maria and Leslie and Willie, I attended the um, district-wide breakfast um, where we welcomed back our amazing staff and teachers. It was a really um, special event. We were happy to have our union leadership present with us and we're looking forward to a great year. Um, I've been carefully watching the developments at Valencia Elementary School with our Measure L project that's just completed and it looks great. So I wanna thank um, our construction and maintenance and operation group, Victor, thank you very much for making that happen. And um, I look forward to a great year, thank you. I screwed up and forgot the breakfast, like I forgot the meeting, <laughs> I'm not kidding. But, um, and I also bought some strawberry tamales from Maria's group. <laughs> they were, and they're super good, they're really good, super good. Um, <coughs> I actually go to committee meetings in the summertime. Um, I think I'm the only board member that does that, <laughs> probably, because I go to the Migrant Head Start meetings and, um, we're now where we're not, we don't have executive meetings. We have meetings from all the um, representatives from all the different pre um, areas and preschools and all over the place. You know, the migrant Head Start works. Um, so there's instead of having about six or seven of us, there's probably about thirty of us at the meetings now. And it's really wonderful to hear about, you know, they talk about their parent meetings. And their parent meetings, <laughs> they have, their parents' meetings have 40, 30 people at these parent meetings that they, they, they do. It's like, whoa, how many times do you hear about that many parents going to meetings? <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Um, and I live right next to Radcliffe, so I've been I've been seeing their beautiful fence all the time. And the only thing else I could say is that um, I rode my bicycle out to the Sierra Azul Nursery and Gardens and they have all the sculptures there, you know, incredible. They have about 60 sculptures there. And they had two really beautiful sculptures from adult education students. They had really two beautiful stones for our, from our adult education students, which was pretty cool. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a very exciting time, returning back to school and all the excitement in the air with parents and students. Um, for my family particularly, it's an especially um, exciting day as our son just started today, his um, first instructional day at Cal Berkeley in their D College of Chemistry. So my family and I just wanna extend our gratitude to the educational system in our community that been, has been a significant part in putting him on this educational path and journey that he started today. Um, as parents and as students, we have been given a plethora of information from the school, as I'm sure the parents and students in our community and our school district have as well. Um, it was brought to my attention this past week by parents who are constituents in my area that this letter was sent home with their children. Um, if you could pass that down. As you can notice on the letter, which came from the district office, it has the current date, the current board president, and the current vice chair of the board. However, when you go down to the board members' names for trustee area two, you see that it has the name of the former trustee who was voted out of this office nearly two years ago, not my name. The parents who brought this to my attention were very confused as they thought they had elected me into this seat. They were further confused because this former trustee is currently running for another position, elected position in our community. So um, I'm just bringing it to the district's attention 
Michelle, I know that you and I had a dialogue back and forth in the spring of 2017 about this. I brought it to your attention and you immediately corrected it. So I'm not sure what is going on with it at this point. Um, but it seems to cl clearly demonstrate a lack of professionalism on the district's administration since the letters coming from the district office. At a minimum, this needs to be corrected. And honestly, I believe an apology is due to the constituents who elected me into this seat whose voice is not being respected or heard. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't have much to report. Um, what I will say, as the spouse of any teacher will tell you, I have spent the last couple of weeks setting up a classroom. So if any of you guys go to Real Del Mar classroom, you're going to see a great classroom. And I know that because I've spent more time there than, um, than I intended to. The other thing I want to talk about is some of the great work. In, some of the great work that we're doing at the Pajaro Valley Educational Foundation. Myself, Maria, and Leslie sit on the board for the Educational Foundation, and I can honestly say I'm really excited to, to sit there. We are, we are really coming up with some great ideas on how to better serve the children of, of our community. As um, most of you, I'm sure, know and are relieved to hear, I will not be running for re-election this season, but that is really, when we talk about our legacy and what we want to leave behind as we move on, that is really something that I'm proud of. I think the Educational Foundation is very exciting, and I really do hope, as I know the rollout went very well um, two weeks ago at the breakfast, I really do hope as we start to, frankly, hit you up for money, um, that you see some of the great work that we're going to be doing and some of the great work that can come from an organization like this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, trustees. Um, so I too went to the Strawberry Festival. I didn't see, there were so many people there. I was trying to find people that I knew. There were so many people there. It was hard to <laughs> find people that I knew, but I did not get a strawberry um, tamale. tamale. Um, but it was a great event. It was really nice to see so many people out there. Um, it was great to see so many people at the breakfast, uh, the Welcome Back Breakfast. We had a lot of new um, employees there and it was actually the um, uh, largest crowd that I've seen and I've been going to every one of them for 12 years so it was really nice to see so many people and vendors there too um, who support our district. Um, PVPSA, Pajaro Valley Prevention Student Assistance, um, that the, we do have year-round meetings and um, I'm happy to announce September 12th we're going to be doing our groundbreaking for our new building. So very excited about that. There's been a lot of work that has, has been put into um, that moving forward. Uh, so uh, hopefully very soon we will have a new behavioral health center. Um, I'm also excited to report that we're going to be starting the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee again. That's with the city of Watsonville. And we will have our county supervisors to be a part of that too so we can work together on um, initiatives that uh, will benefit ourselves, um, the city, and the community at, as a whole. So excited to have those uh, starting again. OK. OK, so item 4.1 is approval of the agenda. Um, Making a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Thank you. I second. OK, so we have. Can I request some modification? Sure. sure. Um, I know that we have um, some teachers here present, and so I would want to move the item 8.2 to item 8.1. So before 8.1? Correct. You're going to start with 8.2? Mm hmm Okay. If there is um, I'll amend my amend. motion to, yeah, to move that item. Willie, would you like to amend your second to move that Aye. item? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Okay, item 5.1, this is approval of minutes for our meeting of July 25th. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Are you're going to abstain? Abstain. Was, <laughs> was that the one? Abstain. No, it was. It, it was, okay. 
Okay. Motion passes 520, correct? Or 5002. Five zero two. Thank you. And uh, minutes for the August eighth meeting, which is our was our special board meeting for the superintendent's evaluation. I move approval. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Abstain. Okay. Motion passes six zero one with one abstention. And item. Number 6.1 is our visitor non-agenda items public comment. Do we have any speakers? We do. Field be chair. I'll just do hand signals. Oh. We're in a high tech world with a low tech solution. Yes. Um, with Jeff stepping down after his eight years, um, I decided I was going to run for his position. And uh, a lot of interesting things have happened while I've been on the campaign trail, and I thought I'd share those with you tonight. Now, this is what <laughs> Jeff and Willie did not tell me about running for this position. <laughs> District 7 is 10 miles long. I've had to replace one pair of shoes at this point in time. I'm not sure I can charge that to my campaign expenses. 83% of that district vote. That means there's 8,300 people I have to talk to. It's dangerous on the campaign trail. The first day I met a man who answered the door and he said, I'm dying, leave me alone, go away. <laughs> what do you say to a guy like that? Shootings. We had a, as you know, last week there was a shooting over in Seacliff well, two days before that, I was on that same street knocking on doors. It's not safe out there. Drugs. A day later, I'm over in Seascape, and there's a young man who's passed out in his car. We couldn't get him to respond. We had to do 9-11 to have him come out and finally get him going, and the sheriff took care of the situation. And then savage dogs. I'll tell you, those dogs look 10 foot tall and they have teeth that are about that long. It's, it's, it's frightening. I even tried to hang my door hanger on the fence and the dog ate the end off from the door hanger. And then just the other day over in Seacliff, I had a ferocious female mathematician chase after me and she said, how can you run for the board when your English grammar in your handout is so bad? It was embarrassing. Unfortunately, she was right, so it was really embarrassing. So let me share what I've heard while I've been out there because I think that's germane to all of us in this room. Vocational training is very important. Over and over again, this is the number one thing they've echoed back to me. What the heck happened to our vocational training? And I, I told them what it's coming. The dropout rates, as we've discussed and we've had presentations, aren't acceptable because that's feeding our local gang. And this was a kind of a surprise to me. Principals should have worked in the classroom before their principals because they, they're clueless and we've had some principals at one time who did not have that experience. Diabetic students are at risk because of not knowing how to uh, inject insulin. Some trust trustees do not return their calls some of the people call the trustees and they never call back. And this leads into how does a person uh, escalate a situation? 
and it's not just the trustees, it's how does an employee escalate a situation within the school district. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Can I clarify any of these issues? My, my shoe size? Uh, thank you, Mr. Beecher. <laughs> Do we have any other speakers? No. Okay, no more speakers to visit our non-agenda. So we're gonna move to item 7.1. Uh, which is our employee organization comments, and we will start with PVFT. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez, uh, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, just wanted to speak on a couple items on your agenda. Uh, number one, the climate action change. Um, if you're not familiar, we have a committee uh, in PVFT. Um, that has been working with uh, this group, or initially started working with this group, I should correct, um, and at this time I serve as advisor on the board, and I think the resolution that is before you um, is a first step in addressing some of the issues that the committee as a whole, uh, or regeneration as a whole, uh, wants to address, and that is uh, ensuring what that we know what the and address the impacts of uh, climate change on our most vulnerable communities. Um, the other item is uh, with regards to uh, two MOUs. Uh, one is an MOU for uh, Pajaro Middle School. Uh, I do wanna make a clarification that the teachers at the middle school voted uh, to change the existing schedule, uh, not necessarily to a six period day, but to something that uh, would work for everybody and uh, the district is committed to working with us uh, in coming up with uh, such a schedule. Uh, so I wanted to uh, make that uh, clarification. Uh, the second MOU uh, has to do with a, uh, providing coaches for teachers on SIPs, PIPs, and STIPs. Um, we had that last year. It's uh, very, uh, very much the same. Of course, the years are different and things like that, but um, the problem is the same we still have an issue with filling positions with fully credentialed teachers. Um, and that does create a burden on teachers at the existing sites. Not necessarily a burden, because many of them gladly do it, but it does take additional work for them to uh, help these teachers. And at this time, uh, there really is no other agency that can support them as they are not currently el eligible uh, for services from other agencies that provide uh, support for new teachers. So we are, um, we, the district and the union, I think are taking a good step in providing that support uh, for these teachers uh, that are uh, just thrown in there as they, as they say. Uh, and then the other item with regard to interns, again, um, uh, I think that having internships uh, with but making sure that uh, those interns are provided with the adequate support uh, that they would need. And hopefully those intern programs uh, do provide that support. Um, we, we are uh, hoping that uh, there comes a time when we won't need uh, those types of MOUs, that we will have uh, uh, positions that are filled and competitive um, people or, or competitive uh, employees that, uh, you know, we won't have to fill positions with uh, teachers that are still working under credentials, but with uh, all fully credentialed teachers. So again, um, please consider uh, supporting those items um, that I just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have someone from CSEA? Hi there. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. Leticia Ropesa, um, President DeRose, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and staff. Uh, Leticia Ropesa from CSCA Chapter 132. Um, I stand here before you with a concern, a concern about something that is on the board agenda. It has to do with grant writing for landscaping, I believe, and I wish there would have been more in the board packet so that I could have read on it and know what it was exactly about. That just, in my opinion, if it, there's something out there that 
is going to generate funds? Will it generate a company? What is attached to that? Um, I'm concerned for our, our employees, for the grounds department especially. So um, that's what I, I'm, is heavy on my mind. Um, also wanted to uh, thank CBO Dominguez because people will now in certain departments be wearing uniforms, which is very important to our community. They would like transportation drivers to identify who is the employee. And um, he came in, proposed that, and it took off. So hopefully uh, we'll be seeing those uniforms soon and we'll bring this level of professionalism up. No, <laughs> I'm done anyway. Um, so thank you. Okay. That's okay. Um, anything else you would like to say? So there's also a concern in regards to what is being proposed today in regards to um, our health clerks uh, and administering um, the Narcon. The Narcon. Um, there, there are state laws that state that it's strictly voluntarily for an employee to administer the Narcon and the what is being proposed today is does not state that it's voluntary. So we need that to be corrected before you vote on it. Thank you. Perfectly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is an agenda item, so that's something that we can inquire about. Thank you. Um, do we have someone from Pavam, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers? Um, CWA, Communication Workers of America, substitutes. No? Okay, thank you. Um, so we are at action items, and we're going to start with the climate change resolution, um, item 8.2. And this is a report by Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, so thank you very much. So. Um, I'll say it was a while ago, unfortunately. So several months back, um, Maria Rosco asked um, for me to investigate um, our ability to do this resolution. So um, we did look into it. Um, we are one of the first in California um, to do the resolution. So um, we are definitely ahead of the game on that. Um, there are other states that are doing it, but. Um, I say one of the first because as far as I know, we are the first, but I'm saying one of the first just to qualify so someone doesn't come up and say, aha. Um, so um, one thing that we want to make sure, in, um, and so I wanted to read um, some of the commitment um, that we wanted to put forward. So um, unless you would prefer, Maria, would you prefer to read some of it? Um, so I just want to read it. It's fairly, fairly short. So um, whereas we believe it's important for us to advocate for climate change to curtail one of the greatest th threats facing communities throughout the world, and whereas there is based broad scientific consensus among climate scientists that human activities contributing to increases in uh, greenhouse gas emissions are the dominant cause in climate change, and whereas children represent a particularly vulnerable group because greenhouse gases emitted into the environment or atmosphere will accumulate over the coming decades and will profoundly impact today's children throughout their lives as well as the lives of future generations. And whereas we believe that climate change should never be a partisan nor a political issue and that policy should be guided by the best available science, and whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District rec recognizes climate change as a children's issue, and whereas a global impact, urgency, and magnitude of the challenge of addressing climate change calls for leadership in all sectors of society, all institutions, and all elected leaders, um, we will ensure that Pajaro Valley Unified School District students graduate as globally minded citizens and whereas the district has a responsibility to minimize its greenhouse gas emissions 
demonstrate leadership, and provide education and actionable solutions that children can engage in to address climate change. And so the, the board, one thing they always ask us is to have actions linked to resolutions. So here are our actions. So we, therefore, we will continue to be clean air leaders, as noted by the Monterey Bay Air Resources District. And the Pajaro Valley Unified School District shall take action on climate change that is within the purview of the district, such as, but not excluding, curricular and educational opportunities, facilities and operational priorities and projects, targets for reducing district greenhouse gas emissions, and engagement in local, state, and federal jurisdictions. Thank you. Okay. So this is an action item. So, um, Maria, would you like to make the motion since you? I will, but we yeah, do after have after the motion in uh, the second. So we do have some speakers. So we want to okay. do that yeah. before I make the motion. Let's go ahead and do the speakers first. So we have Nancy Falstick, Falstish. I'm sorry. Followed by Aileen Clark. Followed by Rachel Kippen. all over yeah. good evening dr. Rodriguez trustees and community members so I'm Nancy Falstick I'm the director of regeneración Pajaro Valley climate action we work with community partners to empower everyone in the Pajaro Valley to respond locally to the global challenge of the changing climate I'm also a longtime PVUSD early childhood educator and parent of a fifth grader at Alianza Charter School and I'm here because I care about our collective future. And I want PVUSD to succeed at its mission, right up here, of supporting learners in reaching their highest potential. Thank you for taking the significant step of preparing a climate change resolution. The evidence is in. The stable climate humans have enjoyed has ended. Scientists agree the situation is pretty bad not just for polar bears, but for people. Our students have a slim chance of reaching their potential or enjoying successful futures that we want if we delay action. Watsonville is precisely the kind of low-income community being hit hardest by climate impacts. But the game's not over yet. At Regeneración, we are determined to do everything we can to take the climate crisis as an opportunity to build a stronger community, to end racism and economic exploitation, and to center local solutions to this crisis on the people most in harm's way, farm worker families who are the backbone of our economy and who fill our schools. We, the people alive today, are the ones who will determine whether this beautiful planet stays inhabitable for future generations. What an awesome challenge, and what an incredible opportunity. I think we can rise to the challenge and restore and protect the living environment of the Earth. I think we must make restoring and protecting the environment an overarching goal driving all of our work as educators, parents, and community members. As a district, please teach all students to care for our shared environment. Please continue to implement policies to sharply reduce greenhouse gas emissions and eliminate waste. When might PVUSD take the step of centering secondary curriculum on reversing global warming and achieving social justice? We hope PVUSD will partner with Regeneración to train new young environmental justice leaders. Who from the PVUSD leadership will be attending the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco? coming up September 10th to the 14th. I invite everyone here to go to San Francisco and take part in the largest West Coast climate action on September 8th, Rise for Climate, Jobs, and Justice. I know everyone here cares deeply about our students. Let's act together so they can reach their full potential. Thank you. And I'd just like to circulate. We have an email list and um, information here about our web.
Good evening, everyone. I'm um, Eileen Clark Nagoka. I'm a teacher at H.A. Hyde School and also a member of um, Regeneración. Um, and I just am so happy that you're taking, you, you've written this resolution. It's really forward thinking and, and really wonderful. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about um, our, the community survey that Regeneración did last year. We did a very extensive, very scientific um, uh, survey that was uh, guided by a professor, and um, there, um, we had 350 respondents, and um, a, a, we tried to get a um, representative sample of, of Watsonville, so, and we were really happy that we were able to do that. Um, and one thing we found, a couple of things we found out was that our community is um, very affected by the effects of climate change, principally because um, uh, so many of our, our uh, uh, parents in the, in the south zone um, are farm workers and extreme weather changes, either high temperatures or lots of rain, um, really affect their, their, um, their, their livelihood. So they, they miss work, they miss income, and it's, it's a very serious thing for them just on, and that, on, that, uh, on that level. And then also, I've been noticing in my classes every year that more and more kids have asthma. And, um, um, you know, I review the emergency cards every year, and this, this year I have more than ever that who, who have asthma and have, you know, um, EpiPens in the office and so forth, and that's definitely um, uh, uh, because of environmental, well, it in part, part of uh, environmental changes. Um, so thank you so much because it's very responsive, this, this uh, resolution, very responsive to the, the parents in our community. Um, also, I wanted to say that um, uh, the, there we at H.A. Hyde on every uh, Wednesday, we have a farm stand there. Another thing that came out of our community survey was that people want um, better access to um, organic produce. And so there's a farm stand that's there. It's sponsored by Food Wet, I, I think. Um, and so it's really wonderful. It's like the very low prices, much lower than you would see at the farmer's market. Um, so um, if there's any way that you all could uh, encourage that to go on at more school sites, that'd be, that'd be really great. Um, and so just finally, I just wanted to say, sometimes this issue can feel so overwhelming, like it's such a huge issue, and we're just these individuals, and we do what we can, but um, things like this really give us hope, and, and um, as small as it might seem, it's, it's a really big deal. So thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. My name is Rachel Kippen. I'm the Environmental Projects Coordinator for the City of Watsonville. I, um, I wanted to start by saying how excited I am and how much I commend and support this resolution um, to take action on climate change. I looked it up before I came here. I did not see any other school districts in the state of California passing any resolution. I was very curious myself if that was the case. So at least from my research and yours, it does seem like this might be the first, which is very exciting. Um, I also agree with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers that this seems like the first of many steps. And so I wanted to offer our support as a collaborative uh, government. Um, we've gone through many similar actions. I'm sure you can imagine uh, creating our climate action plan, working with partners like the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments to do energy efficiency. We're in a big energy efficiency project right now. Um, so we have a lot that we could share just in our successes and challenges in that way that I would like to introduce first myself and offer that as a resource um, as you move forward. And uh, yeah, I also, as I'm sure you all know, being educators and working in the field of education, uh, recognize that intergenerational justice is a, a often overlooked issue. We're so focused on the present um, and that teachers really seem to get that more than anyone else. Um, that not only are we responsible for those young people that are alive today, but those that are absolutely going to come after that um, and making sure that we're you know, providing an environment that uh, supports their thriving. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope that we can have lots of fruitful conversations in the future. Thank you for coming.
And we do have two other speakers. We have uh, Pauline Seals, followed by Daniel Dodge. Um, thank you very much for um, setting this up. I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, I'm a retired teacher. I worked in uh, at Aptos High School 15 years ago. Um, with my friend Roland, uh, we have been doing climate education as uh, volunteers. Last year, we worked at EA Hall School. We worked with the science teacher and the social sciences teacher for several days. It was well received by the teachers and the uh, students. We very much believe in interactive NGSS type um, involvement. Um, we are available. Um, we have also worked with Bajaro Valley um, High School Wetlands Watch students, training them and particularly um, tailoring it to how climate change and the Wetlands Watch work um, interact. Um, so thank you for everything. We're available to help. Two little problems we noticed. One was uh, serious food waste during school lunches. Many, many tossed full containers of milk. Uh, I think this is a misunderstanding, mistraining of the employees that they don't quite understand that they may have to make milk available, but they don't have to force every single kid to take a carton that's going to end up in the trash. This waste food ends up producing a vast amount of methane in the landfill, which is a very serious greenhouse gas. Worldwide, food waste is like number three uh, contributors to, to the problem and, and could be eliminated. Uh, the other thing was the teachers complaining about they have no control of the classroom heat. And to avoid overheating, they have to open the windows. So there's the heat on and the windows open and terrible energy waste. Uh, these things in a big school district are not easy to fix. I remember fighting it in San Jose School District 30 years ago. But those are issues that, that could be looked at as well as actual classroom education. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Hello, board. Daniel Dodge, Jr., a uh, parent of a sixth grade in this district. I attended Mini White EA Hall, Watsonville High, and it's good to see some teachers I'm with the EA Hall with. Uh, I just wanted to say climate change is real. Uh, global warming is real. We could see it with all these fires all around us, the hurricanes that destroyed Puerto Rico. Uh, I just wanted to urge the board to support this resolution because all this is real. All the facts have shown that it's real. Uh, I just wanted to thank for you. Thank you for letting me speak, because I wasn't going to speak. I thought it was another type of event, but I'm glad we're here. And thank you all very much. OK. So um, we have a motion and a second, so I'll open it up to board discussion. Does anybody have any comments, Karen? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm hoping. Um, I have a really good friend who worked in another solar company that I worked in. Um, and he, we have met with Michelle, we met with Victor and everybody because he's willing to do solar for all the rest of our schools for free. Put solar on all the rest of our schools for free and including our district office which uses a lot of electricity that we're trying to work with. Um, and so I keep, you know, texting Michelle, so what's going on with that? What's going on with it? And she says, well, I don't know, that we have to go and put it out to bid, even though it's his is for free. I mean, I guess whatever, you know, that they feel like we have to do. But I'm just saying, I, I've been, we met with Michelle to, and Victor and who else, I'm not sure what, uh, who else we've met with, but um, this, and he, my friend, presented what he's, he could do for the school district in terms of, and, and so we're talking about climate change, <laughs> and I've been supporting trying to put solar on all of our schools with my friend that's able to do it. Um, so I'm hoping <laughs> when we talk about we're, that we're, that we're going to be the stewards of climate change in our district that we 
support this idea that I've been, that I've put forward with the district about doing solar in all the rest of our schools and we don't even, and, it's, and it will be for free. We can put solar in all of our schools. My friend is willing to put that forward for the, for the district. Remember? Remember? Thank, thank you, <laughs> Remember. Karen. Thank you. We need to okay. keep bringing ideas forward. That's good. Um, are there any other board comments? Jeff? And then Kim? Kim, do you want to go first? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what that noise is? Okay, thank you. You know, I, I, I support the concept of solar. I support solar at the schools. I think it's a wonderful way to, um, to shrink our foot, footprint and at the same time save some money. And my father, I should say, was a 40-year employee of PG&E. So, <laughs> I, you know, PG&E put me through college. But I, I, think, I think that solar is important. I, I, and I don't in any way deny the evidence of climate change. I understand, I, the, the, as the young lady said, the science is overwhelming. How are you going to deny it? However, my concern with these kind of resolutions is that we are, a school, we are a school board. And even though I understand how important this is as a statement, the reality is this is really stuff that needs to be taken care of at the state and, and, and um, national level. I, I just, I, I find it to be symbolic and not really, we have, we have bigger issues locally right now in our schools that we should have spent the last 20 minutes on. So even though I have, I don't personally have a problem with this, I think it's, I th think it's important, I think this is good work. Um, this isn't really work for a school board. This is work f that we need to take to Sacramento and that we need to take to Washington, D.C. And that's my position. Thank you, Kim. Well, I think all change happens at the grassroots level, so I'm very proud to support this resolution tonight. Um, one of the things that I am curious about, though, is we have teachers all over our district, science teachers. How are we ensuring that this, um, that global warming is being taught appropriately in these classrooms? So I'll speak to it more, I'll speak to it originally, and then if Susan wants to, um, step in as well, that's fine. Um, so we are actually, we are again going to be presenting at the STEAM conference. So it's now STEAM because there's the A in there for the arts. Um, and we are actually one of the school districts that's recognized uh, for our environmental literacy curriculum that we have. Um, and so we'll be there presenting with staff on that work. Um, and in part, it's mostly due to our collaboration with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, but then it also is includes other entities as well. Um, so we do have a curriculum that at each level, starting at kindergarten, all of our students do receive environmental literacy. Um, it is part of the NGSS standards, which were um, mentioned previously, um, and so it couples nicely with that. Um, one thing that I love about NGSS that wasn't true in past standards is that it, it spirals up. Um, so it used, standards used to skip. So it would maybe you'd get in second grade and then fifth grade and then seventh grade. And how it works now is they ramp up each um, those concepts each time get more and more complex, but they start learning about them at a very young age. SS stands for what? So Next Generation Science Standards. Yeah, I know it. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted yes. the public Next Generation know. Science Standards. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I shouldn't use acronyms, I apologize. Okay, and I still would um, like to see science in all of our um, elementary schools, not just in the just classrooms, but actually a dedicated science teacher in each school. Yep, Thanks. we're moving toward that. Thank you. Okay, Willie. Uh, thank you. Um, I I uh, support this, of course, but I'm I am trying to figure out. I I heard things tonight that were quite new to me, and I have to admit I don't know the full depth of this. Uh, but as a school board member, what what we're interested in is the wellness of our kids, right? So let's work backwards. Anything that affects the wellness of our group, children, looking backwards from that point, what are some of those factors? And I heard tonight 
that the the air and so forth created by the by the climate change affects the air which affects the wellness and and there's a lot more to this than 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 that and i and i and i think that that's ultimately the object of my concern anything that affects wellness whether it's air water etc we should be actively taking a position on so 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 i support this and admit that i need more education and more uh, information as to what all of these things mean thank you and thank so you maria sure thank you and for me what i do want to say is that just to piggy to piggyback on what Willie just said anything that affects our, our students our kids in the district it is the, the job of the board to address those issues in the ways that we can and i think um this resolution is a perfect example of that we're not going to solve the issue now but this is a step in the right direction i think when districts come together who are meant to support the success of students that is a statement and i think that we can move forward this way and really advocate even at the national level um, to have initiatives in place that address the concerns and so with that i do want to make a motion to approve this resolution tonight okay um if there's a second and then i have the comment okay um so i too um support this i think that you know our goals here at pvusd are um, well, everywhere in education are to raise global citizens. And I think if the district can model um, sustainable behavior and show students what that, um, what that looks like and that it is important to us, then um, that's going to filter down to them. Um, so I, I do support this and just want to thank Trustee Orozco for bringing this forward. Um, okay, if there are no more comments, I will go ahead and... Um, um, ask for all those in favor we have a uh, motion and a second uh, aye. Aye. aye 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 any opposed no. okay motion passes six zero one um, we are now on item eight point one this is a budget revision it's called our 45 day revise And we don't mind being trailblazers in the state either. I don't mind saying. <laughs> yeah. You bet. Okay. Um, item 8.1 is the 45 day revise, and this is a report by our Chief Business Officer, Mr. Dominguez. So good evening, uh, President DeRose and members of the board. Um, this evening, just going to present um, our 45-day uh, budget revision. As we're aware, the governor signed uh, the May revise. Um, it is his, um, and we're pulling up the PowerPoint here in a few. the governor uh, for the eighth consecutive time uh, signed a budget on time um, the how it impacts districts throughout the state um, one of the uh, highlights of the budget is that it fully funds uh, our local control funding formula uh, as a district and throughout districts in California the other component that really um, is significant from uh, May is that it reduces our current one-time funding uh, it's reduced so on the third bullet point on the PowerPoint there you see that originally uh, uh, districts uh, throughout California had a budgeted amount of three hundred and forty four dollars per ADA um, so districts within California that had uh, that greater amount uh, and may revise it was reduced to hundred and eighty four dollars per ADA 
we're required within 45 days to make this uh, revised uh, revision within our financial um, records. And so how that impacts our district, it's about a reduction of $2.7 million. Um, the other component is within the 45 uh, day revision, it's implementing best practices. So when there is adjustments, uh, whether it's an increase and or decrease, uh, is making sure that we have and implement fiscal transparency so we inform our board, but also members of our public and our, our stakeholders. Um, so this is just to provide additional transparency of what those revisions are for our district and the impact of the, uh, the revise. Um, specifically, I uh, just want to go by line item, you'll see how this impacts 18-19. Uh, so if you look at the, um, the variance column to the far right, you see that our revenues um, a net decrease uh, for $1.4 million. Uh, however, there's approximately $1.2 million ongoing in our multi-year, but for the current year, it's $1.54 uh, decrease uh, in our revenue. And as I mentioned previously, there's a reduction of our one-time funding for the current year of $2.77 million. And you see that again on the far right column, uh, second to the last. Uh, the 2.77 one-time funds. And so originally you see that it was at, in 18, 19 in July adopt, it was 5.95 million. And because of the 45 day or the May revise is 3.18. And so that adjustment has been made as well. Um, the state legislator and the governor um, in the approach has increased our, uh, as I mentioned, brought us up to fully funded in our local control funding formula, but then also strategically reduced our one-time funding to, inc to make sure that we're at our full LCFF. And then ongoing, they'll also work uh, for one-time funds as we move forward. We're not sure what those amounts look like in the outgoing years, but that uh, to be continued as uh, the budget and the, the state economy. Uh, but overall, um, if you look at the uh, increase and decrease in the middle of the columns there in the, on the far right, you see the variance. So our ending uh, fund balance has been reduced uh, $2.69 uh, million, and that is the impact uh, to our budget. Next steps uh, for us as a district is once we have our 45-day uh, re revision approved, is we present that to and provide that to the county and making sure that that's uh, taken note of. And then we continue our quarterly meetings with our site and department um, uh, leadership and I think I mentioned in a previous presentation is we worked on budget development and now this is the time to work on budget management. And so making sure that with the resources that we have throughout our district, that we stay within our means. Um, in September of 18, uh, later in the year, we'll provide our unaudited actuals. And that's a, an opportunity, a point in time where we look at what's our allocated budget and where are we at as far our actuals. So how are we in comparison? And so we'll bring that forward. And then December, we start our internal uh, or third party uh, independent audit of our district finances throughout our um, whole district. Uh, that'll probably take about 30 to 45 days, and then we'll bring that to the board in January. Um, uh, so those are the next steps for the, uh, us as a district. So um, before we have board questions, I want you to speak to the three year, multi year impact because that was not presented. So uh, the impact to the multi-year, and I'll kind of look at this slide here, is we have a, the reduction of the one-time funds. And for the outgoing years, it's, it looks like it's going to be a positive impact for the outgoing year. However, that's still um, under question and not um, every year annual budget to be verified. But as we speak right now, they're trying to spread that throughout. And so that's where I mentioned with the legislator um, working on that component. And then the other component is now that LCFF is fully funded is now we have a constant because prior there was a gap of uh, financial um, uh, between what was allocated and or budgeted from the state. And now that we're fully funded, we know what that amount is going to be for the outgoing years. So we have LCFF fully funded However, the one-time funds, there'll be a, a, a decrease and or uh, it could be an increase, but we're um, 
as our current fiscal year comes to an end, we will revise and review that as we move forward. Okay, so let me put it a different way. Okay, so we have for, at the Senate level, at the state level, we've been saying for a significant time that the one-time monies actually poses us a challenge because one-time fun, funds in general, you're not allowed to allocate that towards ongoing expenditures. With having 91% of our budget being ongoing expenditures, that's a challenge. So although this may appear is a negative in a way it's a positive because what has happened is they did take away one-time funds but they increased the COLA from 3% to 3.7% which what that means is it gave us more money this year secured money not one-time money but secured money this year next well in a way it took away money this year right because it the one-time monies went down but the um, the ongoing went up slightly right so for this year, it did not balance it out, and there is a negative. But because that ongoing amount will continue for the years, if you look at the three-year projection, the variance is almost nil, right? So in a way, it's a good thing for us because we can then get money that we can depend on versus having money where they say, here's one-time funds for you, and they give it to you at a late date when we don't really know, right? And then that causes us to have challenges because our ending fund balance goes up and all of our expenses or where we wanna put our money is ongoing. So I wanted to make that really clear that although um, it did have a negative impact at this, that you know that 0.7% for us, think of, you know, we have almost 250, you know, $243 million, a, a, almost a whole percent increase is a good thing for us. And so I just wanted to make that very specific. And the one-time uh, funding is dependent on the uh, surplus or the economic status of our state. And so the legislature also fluctuates with one-time funds, so it's more volatile. Then our local control funding formula, uh, it's set, and that formula is impacted on, on our district and the parameters of our funding for low-income English language learners, special ed, et cetera. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we do have some speakers to this item, and then I'll open it up to board questions and comments. Bill Beecher. Good evening again. Um, at a previous meeting when we looked at the budget before, I pointed out that our rate for wages, total compensation wages and benefits, went from 87% to 92% over the next couple of years. I went home and thought about that and stewed, and I went, wait a minute. That means the operating part of our budget, books, pencils, paper, is going to get cut 40%. Now, there is an alternative. We could shut off the heat. We could shut off the air conditioning and save on energy. That would be one way to make up that difference. We haven't heard from the CBO, what are we cutting? in the operating part of the budget because you can't make the budget balance. There's only so much money. If we're going to increase compensation, what are we giving up? This is a question you, the board, have to ask. He can't respond to me. I'm just a little speaker from the audience. But you have an obligation to ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No more speakers. So um, I will ask if there are board questions, comments. Willie, you look ready to. Thank you. <laughs> um, Joe, the, the uh, figures uh, up there show, show us that um, this, is, this is the budget that you're asking us to, uh, to adopt. Has the County Office of Ed weighed in on this? Uh, do we meet all the specs for, uh, th you know, three years out type of thing? Yes, good question. So with this, uh, our current year, the county it has been involved and they've gave a uh, recommendation also with school services and the Department of Education. And so the 45-day revision is uh, meeting with all the guidelines that have been recommended um, and then some within Ed Code. The multi-year are 3% reserves, so all the requirements that we set forth, we still meet all those various requirements in our multi-year. 
What what if the um, I I uh, read someplace just off the internet that the um, pension plans through the state are are in the deep trouble um, and looking like they are m millions billions of uh, funds behind and every local school district is going to have to make up that amount um, what plans do we have I think one of the uh, recommendations that we um, were looking at and we presented when we provided our our annual budget was knowing that our pension plans and um, the rising cost of stirs pers um, is making sure that positioning the district with a reserve um, similar to what our state of California has uh, positioned as a rainy day fund um, similar uh, those components also need to be looked at and so that is dependent on what one-time funds are available and other sources of revenue so that would be something that we are looking at uh, as we speak to position our district so that when that is a, a fiscal liability which it is but if that were to hit our our books that we are able to uh, move through that with a, a reserve and other um, options that we have so it is an ongoing uh, liability and those costs are rising statewide and you're correct districts are grappling on how to take that on and so mm -hmm. districts are the state and uh, uh, Department of Education is also recommending for some reserves to um, be uh, to prevent but also position the district to take that on so that so that everyone's in the in the same situation throughout the state probably yes right so that we're all waiting we don't know if the income is going to go up or we don't know if it's going to go down or whatever it's based that, on the, the state economy, uh, our general state taxes, uh, but we do know that the liabilities of our uh, retirement, the PERS and STRS, is increasing, uh, similar to our, our health care. Um, those are rising costs. So those are areas that, from a fiscal standpoint, we have to recognize that and look at the percentage growth over multiple years and position the district to, in a financial situation, to deal with that. Okay. And... and um uh, trying to get an answer from what uh, Bill was asking about the total compensation is uh, going from 87 percent to 92 percent. How do we? What are? What is the plan? What are we going to cut? What? So what we? What's up? What we presented uh, to the board back in uh, we talked about um, internal efficiencies, if if you recall, and I believe that was an in June um, where we provided and also in our board workshop where we talked about enhancing internal efficiencies one of the areas that we need to focus on is our average daily attendance one is our enrollment but then the students that we do have is making sure that we take and and capture our average daily attendance um, th we're estimating anywhere from six to eight million if as a, s a sizable comparable district if we were to increase our ADA uh, and just take attendance. Uh, so that was one of the areas of efficiency. Another area um, is reducing our workers' comp liability, and so providing safety training throughout our departments, throughout the district, so we're making sure we reduce our claims. Um, the other component is establishing, um, and I think the superintendent can speak to this, about establishing an educational foundation. So not only about reductions, but also increasing revenue. And so working and establishing a foundation to bring in uh, partnerships and grants uh, to support other academic programs uh, throughout our district and so there's various uh, approaches that we're taking on as a district uh, to resolve that and also looking at um, you know I think back in June we gave examples of a, a trans finder in our transportation department having a routing software and we've implemented it to making sure that we have the most cost-effective but time management uh, route efficiency one not only for the cost savings but one for our little ones our little children being on the bus whether it's an hour an hour 30 minutes why are they on the bus so long and so making sure that we can shorten our route times get them to school on time um, and they're ready to learn um, so those are the the um, examples that we shared in june and we're continuing to move forward with those what it, um joe can you give us a uh, timeline you know in the future as to when we might be facing some of these cuts let's say that we expect the revenue to go up but it doesn't go up or let's say that we have to 
um, come up with more money for the um, pension plans. What, what, what is the timeline for all this to happen? When do we have to react? Okay, so one, in our budget, we have all the increases to PERS and STRS already in there. So it's not, um, it's not a mystery, and it's already within our multi-year projections. So we already are aware of where those percentages are going to go up, and we already have that. Um, at this point, we are clear for our three-year projection, um, and we still have um, the three additional percent reserve. So as you guys remember, we have our, our required 3% reserve, and then there's the additional. Um, what I would mention is, um, and we'll hear some of it tonight, but the both the efficiencies and the increased revenue is important to us. Um, so like we're going to hear tonight that we have almost $6 million worth of grant, sorry, I'm spoiling her thing, um, but $6 million worth of grant funding that ha has come into our district in the last 18 months. That's important, right? If we can increase our ADA by just 1%, it includes millions of additional dollars. So our goal is to continue, whether it's um, workers' comp, which we have already decreased by 1.2 million, right? All of those things are things that we will continue to do. So while I am superintendent, my goal is for us to be forward thinking and to not to make cuts. Um, and so we will continue to look at how we can both do efficiencies that doesn't affect staff and children and also raise additional funds through our grant writer, and when the foundation can, through the foundation, but specifically Good. through the grant writer. And one or another great example that we are working with uh, our child welfare and attendance is also a full implementation of a Saturday school for attendance recovery. And so that's something that we're actually uh, gonna be rolling out um, in the next month or so. And so just other opportunities to increase efficiencies and revenue. We also heard that there's a um, increase in uh, in the enrollment that uh, that we're actually getting more kids back from the privates or wherever um, at the uh, high school level. Is that right? Which is which is also revenue that we didn't figure on. So that's outstanding. That's uh, very good. Okay, Trustee Ursino. He stole my thunder, Joe. Thank you. Willie asked most of my questions. Um, the, I, I'm glad to hear that we're talking about increasing revenues and not just cutting costs because I think we're, if you, you can only cut so far. At some point you have to raise your income to support the, to support the lifestyle that you're looking for. Um, I was, but I was reading an article this morning somewhere, this, I think the journal, talking about the, the longest bull run in, in history. And so uh, we've, we're out now of the Great Recession for I, I believe it's eight years. And I, in California, is very prone to the swings of the economy. And I, uh, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, thank you for reminding me that we've already accounted for the STRS and PERS increases. That's, that's very important, and that's excellent planning. What we, but we also need to plan for, and, and please tell me how we're doing that, planning for the inevitable dip in the economy. What are we doing? I think those are the components that we have you know, restricted and unrestricted uh, revenue, um, enhancing our internal efficiencies, that's where it comes back in building up our own rainy fund, rainy day fund. Um, but in order to do that, we need to make sure that we enhance our internal efficiencies and have some cost saving measures. Once we, uh, from a fiscal standpoint, have that ability to do that, then w it's a discussion uh, with the superintendent and the board um, of what how to position our district to make sure that we can take on if that uh, the dip in the economy and or funding does happen. Right, right. it's the win. You're welcome. Okay. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. So this is what I was concerned about. Under my um, one of my presidencies, we did have money pulled back from the state, and it forced us to make some very deep cuts, if I remember correctly, furlough days and some other things. So this is, is feels very palpable to me that the, this budget is, while we think it's going to be good, like you just don't know sometimes. So that's why we always proceed with caution. So just to remind the public, 
our rainy day fund, we have a 3%. Do we have an additional 3% in the rainy day fund? Uh, so we have 6%. Yes. Okay. So if there were, I mean, this, this is the exact scenario that if we needed to dip into it, potentially we could. Correct. Okay. Um, and I know a 3% reserve really only makes payroll for, I think, one month, right? Approximately if about that's a month my and a half. Approximate more than a month, you think? About a little bit over a month. Okay, so just to give everybody an idea of what that means, it's not like we've got, you know, gobs of money just laying out there that we can just use. It really would only pay the bills for a month. Okay. Um, so I had written, before Bill Beecher said anything, on my little pad of paper it says reductions. <laughs> and I think you've um, offered some ideas for that, some revenue building and some, um, I mean, I, I feel like we've gone through this budget our own budget our books so tightly now I and mean, we used to have a little cushion but now it is so lean that um, that I guess you know it's always a good idea to do some planning for what if um, I'm glad we talked about the three-year multi-year would a full day kindergarten bring in extra ADA that's a question for the superintendent really I do not believe so um, I believe it's is because it? because kinder is um, non-compensatory, um, we don't, well, of course we have to do it, but um, people do not have to attend, but I don't believe the extra hours would bring in, because we don't receive ADA by hours, we receive it by day. By day, okay, I'm just curious, I, I thought that was a good idea, potentially. <laughs> it's a good idea anyway. Um, I love the Saturday school idea. H how far down are we doing Saturday? Are you thinking like in elementaries also, or what are we thinking? Actually, yeah. Elementary, middle, high school. In every school. Yeah. We're trying to look at, we're assessing okay. right now every school, uh -huh. but uh, there's some um, looking at the various opportunities that we have. So that's currently great. finalizing. That's great. And using the, are we, w would we think about using the same formula that we had put in place before, which is to reward the school with a certain percentage of that so revenue? Yes. We're looking at also various incentives mm -hmm. and a percentage going back to the site for the attendance recovery. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. You've answered Welcome. all my questions. Thank you. Hey, Karen. The Saturday school, are, it's not like students are required to go to it, obviously. <laughs> I mean, if, if they haven't been, if they haven't attended, are, but they're encouraged to go to it. Is that what, is, is that, is that what happens with the Saturday school? Encouraged. Correct. Okay, <laughs> there, I mean, there would be a way to, I don't know who, is, is the teacher going to encourage them if they haven't been there and encourage them to go to Saturday school? It'll be uh, site leadership, our teachers in, in partnership to encourage our students. And then um, it also, it's an opportunity not only for uh, attendance recovery, but it's also an opportunity for our students to learn because one, if our students aren't at school, they can't learn. and so. Yeah whatever they missed out on. It's an also an opportunity to uh, get additional or some learning time that they missed out on. Right, exactly. So that's the other way they're, that they're encouraged and hopefully their parents see that as an opportunity for them to do that, their parents as well, yeah. Um, so the only thing I was just gonna say, the stirs and purrs thing is so, um, such a bummer, it's so frustrating. <laughs> um, and. I mean, I don't hear of, you know, I remember the CSBA was working on, I forgot what the thing they were working on, but they finally won, I forgot what it was, the CSBA they were working on for a su super long time. What was the issue? They finally got it, whatever it was. Anyways, so I don't know if that's a CSBA issue we should start working on or something, um, how to deal with the stirs and purrs, because every school is district is having to deal with it. I mean, just like, and, and those increases are big enough that some school districts are really going to hurt. I mean, more than even we are. They're going to really hurt, really, by those increases. I mean, hurt, really. Um, so it seems like so um, important that there there needs to be ways to demand from the legislature or something <laughs> that you know when we talk about increases in our LCA, F, 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 that you know we need increases help us pay for the stirs and purrs or whatever, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it just, it just seems like an issue important for us to look at in the future because having them continue to go up and up and up 
you know, it's I, I, I not only feel really bad for this district, but bad for all the other districts, you know, that are having to deal with that. I mean, some of them are really going to be almost in somewhat in trouble, really, having to pay the big yes. PERS increase. They're going to be in trouble. Districts are going to be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I'm, I'm going to go to Maria. Is that okay? Are you yes. done? I just okay. have um, something I just want to put out. It's great that we're thinking about Saturday school. But I really want to bring that uh, back as an, as an item for board discussion because what the least thing I want to see is having students attend summer school where they just sit down on the desk. There's really no instruction whatsoever. And it's, it's, it's almost like, oh, do your homework and just sit there. You know, and I think that's a waste of our time and that's really not useful to our students. So when we're planning, Putting, putting that into plan, I really want to caution that I really want to move away from that. Because um, Saturday school to me is always a, it has always had a negative connotation. You know, it shouldn't be that way. Well, one time it was for people who are in trouble. That's what it was. We, hopefully it's not um, for that anymore. <laughs> so we can bring that back as an item. I think it will be great for the board to be aware of things that we're doing for, for, those, for those, um, that population. We so might just want to rename it, not Saturday yes, school. Not that is yeah. Exactly. Did you have a comment? You. Yes, I did. I have a question. Um, Joe, hello. Yeah. Good evening. My fellow East Bay fellow. Yeah, good evening. Um, could you clarify for me an explanation to the um, increased variance on the expenditures, so the, where that came into play? Yeah, so the increase in expenditures, um, and thank you for the question, is specific to um, the 1.1 reflects the, because in, in um, the previous budget, we were still negotiating with classified. Mm -hmm. And so this is after negotiations were finalized. And so that reflects the, the retro that was negotiated for classified. Okay. And so this also captures any adjustments that were made um, after the May revise. For, so that for captures those that. Revise, yes. And that would include management contracts and any of the like, right? Correct. I would assume, okay. Um, all right. And you know, and I, I would just like to tell on um, Maria, I, I actually had the fortune of um, visiting one of the summer school programs in my trustee area over the summer, and it was a wonderful program, and it was much more innovative than students just sitting and doing homework, and I was just amazed to see some of the stuff that the students were doing over the summer and how excited they mm -hmm. were and their parents that they had that opportunity in summer school, so it's not always that negative yeah, connotation. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to the Super Saturdays, right? And I think yeah. that's a program that we do have in place, but I yeah. think this is slightly different. I, and I agree. I would agree. The delivery know? of the connotation of it is important, but I, I could just say from my experience of visiting um, schools in my area for the summer school, it was really quite innovative, the things that they were doing mm -hmm. and the excitement of the students and the parents alike, as well as the teachers. We have so many teachers doing that, they don't have to be doing that, and they're doing it. So, anyhow. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I don't think we have a motion on the floor yet. So, if someone would like to make a motion. Okay. A second. And a second. Okay. So, all those in favor of passing our 45 day uh, revision of our budget? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes six zero one. And um, we're on to item eight point three. This is the approval of an MOU between PVOSD and PVFT regarding the six period day at Pajaro Middle School. And uh. um, if we can get some clarification on that um, in the um, in the report, uh, Francisco had mentioned mentioned that there might be a difference there. Do you, can uh, you address that? Um, President DeRose, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, as uh, PBFT President Rodriguez shared earlier, the vast majority of our Pajaro Middle School teachers voted in May 2018 to move from a seven period day to a six period day to be closer in alignment with the other middle schools and to promote student achievement. The district and PVFT agreed to negotiate the schedule change for implementation no later than the 2019 to 20 um, school year. 
Um, we will be working with PBFT PMS staff and district administration to form a subcommittee to research uh, six period day options and to provide a proposal by November 1st and going to try to implement it sooner than 2019 to 20. And do we have any speakers to this item? None. <laughs> if you can clarify and then put a card in after, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so the vote was to uh, move from the existing schedule to a, a either six period schedule or a seven period schedule. And the idea was to explore which one was, was the best. And so that's, that's the clarification that I wanted to make. The uh, MOU uh, still says the vote was to a six period day, but the staff is open to a seven period day as uh, after high school, for example, has, uh, but not committed to that. But we wanna leave the uh, opportunity uh, to explore that possibility. Are you asking for a change in language or you just wanted to make the clarification? I wanna make the clarification that the vote okay. was to move away from the existing schedule. Schedule. Okay, you're okay with that. And we, the subcommittee will be exploring different options. Okay. okay. All right. Can I uh, is there any board comments? I, I just have a clarifying question of Francisco. I'm sorry, I'm just a little foggy on that. So you're saying that the teachers are supportive of it. They're not requesting any changed language as you were asked. I, I'm just a little. So the, they they are they're, the vote was to move away from the existing schedule. Okay. Uh, the existing okay. schedule is a seven period day. Seven period day. Yeah but it's a seven period day. Uh, it's very different than the seven period day at after high school. And so, but they're open to keeping a seven period day, but with the uh, provisions and conditions that after high school has. And are you feeling that that language is in here? Uh, no, the MOU just uh, specifically says moving, that the vote was to move to a six period schedule. What I'm saying is that the vote was to move away from the existing schedule. So I think that I, we I are televised and that is, that's on the record now. That's why I asked that question. That's why I said it during my five minutes. So you're, so you're saying from the perspective of the teachers who are affected by this, they are fine with this MOU as it is written? The, with the uh, November 1st um, uh, timeline, and with November the 1st, fact 2018. Th November 1st, 2018, and with participating and looking at uh, changing the, or creating a committee to look at the change. Okay, and that language is in here and you're supportive of that. Do you feel comfortable with it? Or the teachers that are affected, I'm asking, are feeling comfortable with it? Yes, that. we did We we did clarify that what the vote was, and we if, if you want to change it, that would be fine. Um, but as Trustee uh, DeRose said, uh, it's on the record, both during this uh, uh, agenda item and during uh, my presentation. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Great, yeah. The clarification. Thank you. I, Maria? Oh, I didn't. Okay. Oh. Uh, I'll go ahead. No. Um, there is, in the MOU, if you notice, it's pretty general. Um, whereas the district and PBFT agreed to negotiate the schedule change for the 2019 to 20 school year. So it, it's pretty much in there. We have to negotiate what options, we're going to explore the options and then negotiate what options we feel is best for PMS and the students. Okay, okay, thank you, Kim. So the real question here is not so much the language in my mind of the MOU, but what is this for the kids at the school? So why the change? What kind of, I thought I had read that they were already at seven periods, but maybe that's, in, oh, that's correct. So it sounds like maybe they wanna move potential, I mean, I know there'll be a subcommittee and there'll be findings that will likely come before us or maybe not, I don't know. Maybe you can clarify that, but what's wrong with the current schedule and why this move now? 
Um, the, the teachers, when they voted, they felt that the seven period traditional schedule wasn't um, the best schedule to serve the needs of the students. So, and it was very different from the schedules that the other middle schools have as well as the high school. So what we wanted to do was form a committee with PMS staff as well as district administration, um, especially at services and HR to uh, and PVFT to explore different options that might um, help promote student achievement better. And we are hoping that the subcommittee can come together with a proposal by November 1st and um, try to implement it um, as soon as we are able to. Okay, so. So uh, that sounds reasonable reasonable to me what what are what's the objection again francisco there there's not an objection there is none no he okay so okay. that you guys are okay with that Yes, we are okay with having a committee in which the teachers participate in uh, what their schedule is going to look like. They have the uh, have input and a timeline as to when uh, this will be accomplished. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would someone like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the MOU. Thank you. Is I'll there a second? second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you, Dr. Colleen. Um, item 8.4, um, asking for a, approval of an appointment of a teacher on provisional internship permit. Yes, um, um, President Rodriguez and I agree sometimes, huh? Um, there's still a significant shortage of teachers nationwide, and although our district team assertively engages in a myriad of recruitment activities, shortages of appropriately credentialed teachers still exist. Um, similar to other districts, um, we are submitting for review and approval for, by our Board of Trustees applications for provisional intern permit to meet our teachers' need. Um, this PIP application is for Julie Passantino, who already has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and she uh, is going to be working on a multiple subjects credential to allow her to teach math science core at PMS. Okay, we don't have any speakers to this item. To, is there any board discussion or questions? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I will second that motion, but I do have one question. Okay, go ahead, and then I have um, so I know that um, we, we often get these. Um, and so my question to you is, uh, we're allowing these individuals to work for the district, uh, but looking at past experiences, how many of these individuals that have received the special permit uh, have committed and stayed in the district? That's something that I would wanna know. Um, we have some of that data for you, and I was planning to address it on the next item. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So it's my recollection that we used to have many more of these. There will, be a, few, there will be a few more. Um, this year, um, because we started recruitment early, and um, we have a lot of uh, teachers that stayed with us um, this year, um, we um, are not, you know, we're not going to need as many of, of, of these as in previous years. And I was just going to say, I was going to give uh, the administration kudos for going out. I believe you started recruitment efforts in January, January. which not only um, fills those spots, but we really get the cream of the crop when we start early like that. So I'm, I was really impressed, and this is a reflection of that effort. So. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. So um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0, thank you. And item 8.5, um, 
Go ahead, Dr. Sorry. Colleen. <laughs> Thank you, um, President DeRose, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, coaching support is needed for teachers in intern programs as well as teachers with short-term teaching permits and provisional intern permits. And these are teachers that are not being served by the um, new teacher project because they only serve the teachers in the beginning teachers um, program. And this MOU with PVFT will allow the district to provide coaching support to maximize the effectiveness of this new group of teachers. And voluntary teacher coaches um, at each site will be selected from current experience and tenured teachers with PBUSD to provide general non-evaluative support in curriculum planning, instruction, pacing strategies, and successful classroom management. The voluntary teacher coaches will receive a stipend of $1,300 and $1,307 for the year. Um, last year, um, when we first implemented this program, we had 60 teachers approximately that participated. Um, this year, we only will need um, 49, so we dropped down by 10. And last year, we had 60 that participated, um, and although 17 um, left the district, uh, we had an approximately 43 that were that remained with our district, 10 of whom actually um, finished off with their credential, and 33 we would like to continue the support um, of our stellar um, coaches at the site and you know continue to work with PBFT on that. So this year we're only looking at 49. Um, instead of 60, and um, only 16 of those are, are new, 33 are continuing. Great, thank you. Great. Are there any other questions, Kim? I see your thumb hovering on the speaker. <laughs> no, anybody else? Okay. Well, I, do, I just want to make a comment <laughs> after I make a motion to approve. Can we have a second? So, um, I was for many years, every year for many years, a parent volunteer on the campus of one of our elementary schools. And I witnessed, um, as I worked in the classroom and alongside the teachers, several of these voluntary coaches, which some of them did um, special programs through Coatsen, which you know was an amazing program that helped teachers reach their full potential and then coach other, you know, te well, you guys know the program. Um, some were special science teachers, some were, um, had done s really amazing math programs, so, and they were so good at teaching math and teaching their colleagues math that my kid scored like the highest score ever on his math you know, yeah. um, tests many years in a row. So I, I do see this, they're so valuable to have these volunteer our voluntary coaches on the campuses and I want to thank whoever brought this forward and I think it's a good use of our money and resource to help our new teachers find their way so thank you thank you Kim so we have a motion and a second all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed motion passes 7-0 thank you and uh, we're at item 8.6 and this is the second reading on board policy on graduation requirements um, are we going to pull that up or no? Um, I can if you would like me to. I wasn't planning on it. I mean, okay. Um, so how we do with our board policies, and um, just to reiterate for the public, is we do a first reading um, that allows um, the public to see it, also the board to make comments, um, and then we come back. So one thing that came out of the additional, the original first reading was that the board policy actually did not, um, was silent on adult education in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you will see is you will see that there is um, additional information. Um, we did that purposefully, so you'll see it in green um, that shows um, how we are going to be integrating adult education into the board policy. There is one slight change, um, and um, that is on the grid, um, which is within the administrative regulation. Um, it states incorrectly that adult education is still 220 credits. It's actually 200 credits um, because they don't require the PE requirements. Right. Um, but um, I just want to highlight um, for you guys uh, the the key changes that I know I had mentioned this before, but. Um, we had some absences, so I just want to um, 
really highlight the, the good work that we did. So this came out of the Education Equity Audit, which was an 18-month process that really looked at how can we align our, um, our course requirements, our grad requirements to what we believe is important. And so one thing that was mentioned was that we want our kids, because of looking from an asset model, we want them to um, use um, world language or language other than English. We want that to be a requirement, um, not only so that then they have the ability to go to a four-year if they wanted to go to four-year, but traditionally our students actually do really well with, with that. Also, before, they either chose between VAPA or world language, and they chose between the two. Um, so now what we're doing is we're stating that there's also an importance with VAPA which is, um, it's, it's fairly common requirement um, for other school districts. The other is that we actually are gonna now have a requirement for the students to take a one-year CTE or applied arts um, class. And so that can be a, a broad range. So it doesn't have to be one specific area. It can be in digital media or it can be on auto mechanics or whatever that that child wants. We have multiple pathways. Um, where you might say, well, where is all that stuff coming from, right? So where is it that are we requiring kids to do more classes? And the answer is no. That prior we had 45 elective credits. Many of those elective credits were a lot of times empty credits, meaning that they didn't really lead the student to anywhere because they were kind of a one single 10 courses here or there and didn't really build for the students this portfolio of I have great content knowledge based on my talents, interests, and passions, right? Um, so the actual number of credits did not change. Um, I had mentioned this before, but the hard credits, we already had high. So the hard ones was three years of math. We already had that in our grad requirements. And then three years of science was another one, and we already had that. I will note that um, the state is going towards both of those as requirements. It's currently two, 2020 or two years, two years. Um, and they're moving towards that. So we're going to be ahead of the curve um, on that as well. Um, and so um, we're proud of the requirements, and it definitely was a, a collaborative process um, yeah. that we had almost um, in total, if you count the steering committee, 100 people that were involved for 18 months on it. Do we have speakers to this item? We do. Gina Gadino, Cole. Good evening. Good evening, board, um, trustees. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, everyone on that side as well. It's on. Do I just need to speak closer to it? Um, I I'm here to speak um, about removing the health requirement. For um, being a graduation requirement, that really concerns me. Um, as a mom, for starters, I have one child that's already been through high school, one that's a sophomore, one that's coming into high school. I see that this doesn't go into effect for quite some time. However, um, you're stating that the the health, um, the following subjects that are required by the Ed Code: first aid, narcotics, dangerous drugs and alcohol, fire prevention safety and accident prevention, HIV prevention, and that they can be completed through health, PE, or science courses. So if you're gonna pull, a sci or if you're gonna pull health, um, the PE requirements, the only thing, and, and these don't match what I pulled up from the ed code. That was another concern. Um, maybe I was looking in the wrong place, I'm not sure. But the health requirements that I, look, I saw from the ed code were nutrition and physical activity, growth and development and sexual health, injury prevention and safety, which you is attended to here, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, uh, mental, emotional, and social health, personal and community health. I, I know that those are being addressed in the health classes in the high schools now. Um, I know that different high schools do it in different ways, that Pajaro Valley High School has gone to integrating with, um, with PE. I'm not at all convinced that those standards are being hit during the PE classes. I, I just don't, um, in my experience in dropping into those classes, I'm not seeing that happening. Um, I'm concerned because it, the, the growth, development, and sexual health really concerns me. 
I can't tell you how many girls do not understand how their menstrual cycle works. And that, to me, would indicate if we're not getting it at school, a lot of times culturally we're not getting it at home. We're not having that conversation with our daughters. Where is that going to happen? And what safe space in a class of 70, you know, 45 anyway, of in PE, a giant class of PE, where is that safe place for that to happen? So that is a big concern for me as a mom of a daughter. Um, I, I know that PE is really important. That I, I thoroughly believe we should have four years of PE. I know kids can do that as an elective, but I do not feel that health is something that can be pushed aside, that can be integrated into something else. I think that health is something that is super, super important and all of those things, nutrition and physical activity, sure they might hit that in PE. Um, growth and development, probably they're gonna hit that a little bit in PE. Injury prevention, sure. But the sexual health is not gonna get there. The alcohol, um, tobacco and other drugs may not get there. Social, emotional um, health may not get there and community, personal and community health might not get all the attention that I believe it needs. So there's my two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask for a clarification? Yes. Um, are we dropping a health class? I was so, not aware of that. No. So how it works is the state requirements have changed in which now it, there is no longer the requirement to have one semester of health. It is true that each one of our high schools does it differently. So um, Watsonville High has health teachers. PV High uses their PE teachers, and, um, and, and Aptos High uses their science teachers. What I will say is that there is required, and you guys um, approved it last year, so it, it was, or there was updated required um, curriculum. So all that curriculum is actually in the school. So regardless of who it is, um, whether it's a PE teacher um, or it is the science teacher or the health teacher, all of those teachers have the particular curriculum, whether it's the required um, sex, ed, ed, sex ed, we have a huge requirement now for HIV and, and health sciences. So all of that is up to date and within the schools. Um, and all of the PE teachers that do have health, um, they also have a classroom in which they can um, work with the students. And we make sure and do um, appropriate um, sex correspondence um, during the time in which we're doing the sex ed piece. So my daughter, a freshman at Aptos High, had a health class. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a requirement. It's it wasn't currently science. done by It's currently done by science teachers. That was not my recollection. She was not a science teacher and I think that we should have health classes at every single one of our or all, all every high school actually, not just comprehensive <laughs> comprehensives, but all of them. I, I don't think PE teachers should be teaching health. I'm sorry. So anyway, that's my two cents. Um, you know, having been a parent who's just gone through this with high school students, um, I, I echo some of the same concerns. I, and you, I, uh, backing on what you said, you said at Watsonville High, at PV High, at Aptos High, and I would assume at Renaissance, based on what you're saying, it's being taught differently at, by different teachers at each one of these institutions, these schools within here, within the district. So uh, what I'm questioning is why can't this be uniform because, you know, if a family moved from Aptos to Watsonville or vice versa and they're for whatever reason and the student changed. So that student when they enter a freshman year of high school doesn't matter which school that when they're going to be a graduating senior the expectancy can be the same. I mean is there like is there a reason we can't with just those four high schools have it at, at least the three be the same so there's no possible fallout. Yeah. So um, there's quite a bit of disparity at the, at the schools um, or differences of how things were allowed to be implemented. Um, one thing I will say is um, it, it does have to do with credentialing and current staff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not impossible, um, but it would definitely require us to have um, shifting of staff. 
um, at the site. So again, it's not impossible. I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to adhere to state requirements and ensure that we are moving forward on the items that we feel are important for the education of our students. I do feel, I feel strongly that um, our teachers are teaching it um, with parity. Um, now their credential, the teacher that's teaching it may be different, but they're teaching the same curriculum. So w would you be open to, if this was approved with that stipulation, that it be made uniform so it was an actual structured health class at all high schools and being open to seeing that that be implemented? So it is uniform at whether you're at Watsonville High, PV High, Aptos High, or Renaissance? Mm -hmm. The challenge is that it's a half year course. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, when you're looking at full year courses and trying to align through A through G. So I'm a big one. If you, and you know, people that work with me know that I say almost nothing is impossible, right? Almost nothing is impossible. It's just trying to figure out how do we maintain the other requirements um, and still allow that to happen and then work with the staff that we have. Um, this isn't going to be implemented until the year 2022, I believe the students are, or 2023, I'd have to look at the, um, so, um, you know, it's definitely something that we could, we could look at. For sure. Okay, and then the other, aside from that being brought up, the other one that I had concern, I know I heard you say that the, the students aren't going to be expected to take, because knowing how much it is on high school students mm -hmm. and what the expectancy and other things, whether they have the extracurricular of sports or they have to work, my concern too, I, I heard you say that there would be no more expected courses up, put mm -hmm. upon them. That's correct. But when we talked about, you t spoke about the language, and it sounded like a language versus VAPA, vice versa, like there'd have to be a pick and choose. No, it, with these new, they get, they would do both. Be, currently, the current is so they choose one. They'd be mandated to do one or the other? Or no, both? they would do both. And how does that not add more on top? Of because that? they don't if have to do as many. G student. They don't have to do as many electives. So always the courses was 220 mm -hmm. credits, which was 22 courses, if you kind of think of it that way. So they were always required to do 22 year long courses. Mm -hmm. um, what is happening is it used to be that 45 of those credits were um, just different ones. And now we're funneling that in and we're having it to where only 30 of those are um, different elective credits. Now we're, we're promoting them to, um, you know, to be language learners. We're, in, we're promoting them to um, expose themselves to one year of a visual and performing arts, right? Whether it's choral or it's drama or something like that. Um, so we're, we're trying to help them um, sometimes, you know, um, to broaden their horizons with, um, and just with a one year course. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, my feeling on it is just for security and sake that I could only move forward supporting it if we could get that clarification and, and assurance tonight that we would have the, the semester health course be the same in Aptos, Watsonville, Pajaro High, and hopefully Renaissance High. Um, so that's kind of where I stand with that. Willie. Um, Having, having uh, taught PE at Watsonville High School uh, for many years, um, you know, I think that we, sh we, 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 sh we shorten the emphasis on each of those, on health and PE. Uh, and I, and I kind of support what, what um, Trustee um, George is, is uh, going to, to um, having separate, um, health classes and a separate PE classes because because the emphasis and 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 then the other thought is that in PE classes now many of them are co-ed so you need to separate I would think anyway and so so I think um, by the way uh, Gina's father was probably probably the best PE teacher that I've ever worked with in my life so I just want to throw that out to you know. 
you know. Anyway, the, the, the uh, point that I'm trying to make in support of what Trustee George is saying is that we need to keep the emphasis, health is so important that we, that as a PE teacher, you need to just concentrate on that class for that hour and someone else do the, the uh, health ed stuff. And is there any way that, uh, because this is not gonna be put in, put in place until um, 2025 or something like that. Maybe we should take a uh, take a little time to see if that's possible. And if it's not possible, come back with the option. And if it is, okay, then and then let's see it see it because maybe it might be the best best avenue. And at uh, Watsonville, we always had uh, sophomore. Um, so what was it called? Sophomore requirements, and it was it was health ed, driver safety. Um, and, and all of that stuff, so, which was a separate class, and, and I think that we ought to back off right now and see if that would work. Would you mind addressing that, what his, um, his question is, what would happen if we did pull this and we brought it back? Um, we can pull it. Um, it's the, it is important that we start the conversations with the students. Um, these are eighth graders. The, the current eighth graders are the ones that will be affected by this. So it would be important that we start the training with the counselors in the fairly near future. Now many of them were involved in this. Um, I would prefer to pull it and answer the question just because it's not out of not wanting to make the change. I wanna make sure that we technically can um, with staffing requirements and looking at um, how it would affect master schedules because right now um, it would highly affect the master schedule of um, any of our schools. And it seems like, well, it's so far off, it, why would that matter? But when you think about it, it's, it's just next year's and we do master schedules we batten down high school master schedules by January. So um, it, we just would need to make sure that, um, that it's possible before we commit. So would it have um, less of a disruption if you took another five off of electives and put that back into health? And my second question is, are we, um, we're not providing health classes in middle school because I think that's where it really needs to be. Middle school. No, there's there's also requirements at the there, middle school level. Yes. Okay. This is just just pertains to the high school requirements. So it's not that we don't do it. Um, this is just the the graduation and high school requirements. So. so we can pull this and we can bring it back sometime in the near future with um, uh, some options. Sure. Okay. Is the board okay with that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, and and if I may, just yes. Just w just one last comment. I was so happy to see the um, requirement that now we're putting in CTE into the graduation requirements. That's really important, and I want to thank. Um, uh, Michelle for and, and and also the staff for making sure that the CTE we feel that that's going to be something in the future that everyone's going to have to do and we're ahead of, ahead of it and so I thank you Michelle for doing such a good job with that thank you thank you for mentioning that and and also we saw in Bill Beecher's um, his presentation about his campaign trail that the community wants that and when we started the uh, local control funding formula in our LCAP, that's what we saw in our community meetings as well, that that was one of the top three priorities uh, throughout the community. So yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, item 8.7. Um, this is the second reading of proposed board policy on administering medication and monitoring health conditions. And you'll have to put that up. This is um, yeah. I'll, a I'll report from Heather Gorman. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll speak to it. Um, okay. She wasn't prepared earlier. Um, so we had the presentation by the nurse um, the last time that we, we got together. And so this is just the board policy that, that aligns with that. Um, and so we, um, 
you know, we, we can go over the PowerPoint again, but um, we did have a, a complete presentation the last time. During this my CSEA meeting, it is accurate that they spoke to me regarding the addition of the voluntary, and so we would like to add that, um, that it is um, those that are um, volunteer, that volunteer to be trained because they do need to be trained. So um, I want to make um, that note, and um, if the board would like to we can go back over the PowerPoint but um, the purpose of the second reading is to Hopefully do revisions in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, uh, when, oh do we have speakers? Thank None. you. No speakers to this. So um, when and if a motion is made I would just ask that that, um, that change be included in the motion. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And is there any questions or comments from board members? Kim? No, I'm in, f I'm in full support of this. I think um, it would be a very rare occasion that something like this would need to be used. But like Bill said, he found somebody in a car who was passed out, and who knows? He could have needed Narcan. So um, I think it's a good thing for us to have this on all of our campuses. And I'd um, probably like to make a motion tonight to support this with a noted change in wording that it's voluntary for training. Thanks. I'll second that motion. Was that a motion? Okay. Jeff. Dr. Rodriguez, I'm in full support of this, of course, but if it is voluntary, how are we going to ensure that we have somebody at every campus? So the, um, the nurses were the ones who brought this forward originally and asked us to look at it. Um, we know that the nurses are in full support. Um, so they not only came and presented on it, and you had many of them in the audience the last time. Um, so what it would be is the nurses would be the ones that would um, for sure be trained. Some of them have already been trained. And then um, both administrators um, would be trained. Um, as well as um, the classified staff that volunteered, um, so which would be the health assistant. So you'd always have the, the principal and assistant principals trained. They're always trained. The, they so will the, be trained. So the principal, assistant principal don't have a choice? Um, no, they're management. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is even though it's voluntary, there will be somebody at every campus that has, the, that, that has this training. Yeah, is voluntary for this, for non-management. Yeah, has this voluntary training, quote unquote. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. You made a motion. Okay, and we have a second. So, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Karen's away. Six zero one with Trustee Osmondson away from her seat for a moment. Um, okay, item 8.8, .8, and I'm going to start this one if you don't mind, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so part of the uh, responsibilities of the Board of Trustees is, is to do uh, the evaluation of the superintendent once a year, just like um, all employees get evaluated. Um, it's, it's our job to give Michelle um, an evaluation, or the superintendent, uh, which we did um, at a uh, special board study session on August the 8th. Uh, prior to that, um, each of the trustees received an evaluation form. And um, I led the effort as, as president, so I collected those and summarized the um, uh, evaluations from the, the trustees and then presented those findings to Dr. Rodriguez last Tuesday at our regular one-on-one -on -one meeting. And um, with that, once an evaluation is completed, if the board recommends that we continue with her, her contract as our superintendent, we um, would extend the contract for one year. So I will go ahead and um, let you finish. So um, last year I, I did a presentation for the board um, and we didn't, um, we didn't make it public um, just because evaluation processes in general are, are, um, are private. Um, I um, wanted to be transparent and demonstrate the level of accountability that all employees have and so people can see the presentation that I did um, for the board. Um, and, um, and then um, 
I just think that we have made incredible progress and I'm proud of the work that we have done. We do have significant work still to do and um, we're dedicated to do that work. So um, the extension of the contract is a one year extension. Um, there, the base salary is, is updated and it reflects the six is it, it's the six percent um, which is customary with uh, management in the district um, other than that there's no salary increase and um, with that I will ask if there are speakers to this item none okay and any any comments questions from the board Clear. let's go Willie and then Jeff clarification when uh, you said extension of one year or it's one year we're adding so we're adding one year to the contract correct so so it's a contract that we originally mm -hmm. had plus we're adding a year to mm -hmm. it I just wanted to make sure that it's just not one year right yeah so she's locked down till when hmm? How long forever do we have her? no I'm kidding <laughs> um, no until um, this would expire 2021 is that correct Mm -hmm. okay. Add another year. Yeah. We're adding a year. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, yeah. you, you know, I, I don't really have much to say except to Michelle. Thank you. I when I think back about how far we've come in in, in a short period of time, sitting through that evaluation and hearing about all the progress that we're making, you can kind of feel it in the room sometimes when people are uncomfortable. But our students are being positively impacted by the changes that are st starting at the head of the house and all the way down. So I make a motion to approve this. I, if it was up to me, if I got to choose, I'd do a 20-year extension and really nail you down a long time. Um, you have made positive in, you have made a positive impact on 20,000 students, and we appreciate it very much. Okay, any other comments? Comments. Um, uh, Michelle, you know that I've been here for many years and probably worked with the seven superintendents. They've all been good, and um, and and they all served a purpose. They uh, got us through the recession and so forth and so forth. The last two years have uh, been the most exciting for me because all the things that we've been building in the past are now coming coming up and getting done. Because you're, I was uh, watching a um, movie the other night. Cause nothing else to do, and I and I saw this movie called The Closer. And we're talking about our superintendent being able to close things and getting things done and finishing like the PV Hive project was, was huge and she got it closed. And there's other things that we've been working on over the years, the math. The math. And I want to just mention the math because one of the things that we put in the graduation requirement is the additional year in algebra. Well, if you don't start in the third grade to get kids ready, it's not really fair for these kids to come up and now fail. We got to start earlier. And so the report about the status of the school district shows a definite gain in third grade and fourth grade math. So when these kids come up, they're going to be ready to graduate because we put in the fact that you have to pass algebra. And if you don't start early, it's almost impossible to. So things like that so that vision and getting things done thank you very much okay okay well um hello oh go ahead. yeah um so i would just like to echo what my two board members said we had this was a district where um for many years on the board i felt like i was hitting my head against a brick wall in terms of wanting certain things to happen change to occur academic achievement to grow certain departments to um, to not put barriers in our way of, of achieving um, something new and different and important for our kids and I feel like under your leadership that's happened um, when I look around this room and I, I see um, the faces out here some um, excellent um, people that have remained in their positions or been promoted and others um, grown from within and promoted to directors I know every single person out here is working 
um, as hard as they can um, to achieve the changes that we so desperately needed for the kids in this district. We have a, this, we're a family really in Pajaro Valley and we have a lot of really good things and I think those things haven't changed. What has changed is that people who don't want to do the work um, are not here anymore. People that don't want to do, that, that, want, that want things to, to remain the same even though they're not working are not here anymore and what I see are the people that remain are um, dedicated to making this place better and I want to thank you for um, for your work because I know it's not easy I know I'm, I don't think you sleep actually um, <laughs> so I think all of us as a board want you to take good care of yourself we um, are very happy that you're building a, a great cabinet we're very happy with the work that's happening here looking looking forward to um, to, to, to watching the continued growth and success over the next few years. So thank you for your service. Well, I really couldn't have said it much better yeah. myself. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kim. You. Um, so <laughs> I'm just going to echo that. I'm really pleased with um, the movement that we've seen in a short time, and I'm looking forward to um, the, I, I think we're going to get a report in December again because movement is happening so quickly we get multiple reports throughout the year and yes um, it's everybody's uh, feet on the ground pushing for the same um, outcomes and um, it's hard to come in and make change um, so uh, that's commendable that um, you have created a team and you hold yourself as accountable as you hold everybody else accountable to yourself and mm -hmm. I think that that's commendable so do we have a motion yes Gonna say, um, I was, um, yeah, this is, you know, in my, I don't know how many years, I've been here. Um, these have been the most exciting years that I've been here. I mean, a lot of it's because of you, but you know, just a lot of things that having VAPA, you know, having actually art and actually having music and having bands in the school and people you know, doing vocal. I mean, just like. It's like, whoa, you know, I mean, my years, have, you know, they haven't been this great, you know, before. Um, and a lot of it has to do with work that you've done, too. Um, I, f I feel so optimistic about our future, really. I super feel optimistic. And, um, you know, and just the way we've been able to, we're going to have the grant writer talk to us tonight about all the grants that she has written, and it's just, like, incredible how much money we've gotten from our grant writer. And that was a suggestion from Michelle. Michelle said, you know, I would like to be able to hire a grant writer. I'd like you to support hiring a grant writer. And yeah, we did. <laughs> okay. And, um, and, all, and, and just the amount of money we've saved in, um, we're doing much better in special education with, you know, all the stuff that we hadn't done there before in terms of, Appearance and you know, issues they had, whatever. But I'm just saying, and the just you know the the money we've saved in workers' comp, whatever. But I'm just, I've, I've just seen such a big difference in the school district um, in my years. Makes me really excited. And also, I was going to say to you, I was going to say to everybody here, that you're going to give a presentation of your of your progress at the breakfast. It's on the 26th of October. There's going to be a breakfast for all you to know that. There's going to be a breakfast That's at true. the community room at the city. And Michelle will be there giving a presentation on the progress that we've made. And there's going to be other things happening there too. It's the state of the district. It's the state of the district. That's what it's yeah. called. It's called the state <laughs> of the district. It's going to be October 26th from 8.30 to 9.45. And then everybody that's here and hopefully a lot more people <laughs> would be able to come and um, listen to her state of the district. It's going to be pretty exciting to listen to it. Great. Thank All you, right. Karen. Do Can I have just a say one thing? Yeah. Just really quick, because I do want to thank Michelle for the amazing what she has done. I want to thank you for being so student-centric, but also um, providing staff with the support that they need, the cushion they need to ensure that they reach their potential. I think it, that's a very valuable. It's something that I hadn't seen in the past, at least the first four years as a board trustee. Um, and it's something that we were looking for. I like the fact that you're a leader that leads by example. So 
if you don't slack, the expectation is that other staff members won't be able to do the same, right? Because you, you, you hold yourself to so many high standards and that I think energy and motivation trickles down uh, to the rest of the district. Um, and you even hold us as board members accountable <laughs> for our actions. Um, so, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, I actually would like to make the motion okay. to approve the extension of um, our superintendent's contract. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't think so. Motion passes 601 with Trustee Acosta away from her seat. Okay, um, now we're on report and discussion items, and this is item 9.1, uh, pursuing purposeful new funding aligned with, aligned with district goals through a grant writer. And Andrea Wiley, our district grant writer, will be giving the, um, the report. Andrea Willie. Hello, uh, President Thank you for Rose. sitting through the yes, sitting long through my meeting, but given by others. Uh, thank you, President <laughs> um, Board members, Dr. Rodriguez, colleagues, and community members. I'm thrilled to be here tonight to talk to you about the activities I've been doing as the district grant writer. Um, okay, I've never used this little guy before, so much just I guess the forward button. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity. And maybe other way? Oh, okay. Um, my efforts uh, lie in finding new funding sources to support the district. And I uh, regularly scan across four domains that you see up here. Local, um, and these are f either funding sources we've secured or funding sources where I'm looking for opportunities to come up or things that are actually in the hopper right now. So local, it is the County Office of Education, the Community Foundation Santa Cruz County, Core Investments, which is a Santa Cruz County cons funding consortium, Watsonville Rotary, Monterey Peninsula Foundation, Kaiser Community Benefit Program, and the Pajaro Valley Community Health Trust. At the state level, um, I monitor and, and staff and colleagues and others often send me information if they see something come up. Um, California State Department of Education, Orange County Department of Education, the California Collaborative for Excellence in Education and the California Energy Commission. Um, at the federal level, we are always scanning across the Department of Education. Very little coming out of that department right now. National Science Foundation, Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And then there is, of course, the private sector, which tend to be foundations and corporations. Footsteps to Brilliance, Chevron Stem Zone, Project Lead the Way, Cisco Systems, Target, OmniPro, Alliance for a Healthier Generation, Raleigh's Extra Credit Program, VH1, the Wells Fargo Community uh, Giving Program, and the Cedar Tree Foundation. Um, and let's see. Whoop. Going the other way. There we go. Um, and one of the biggest um, uh, initiatives that really has landed in the world of um, proposal development and philanthropic uh, world is collaborative landscape, meaning that to be effective in f um, seeking proposals and winning proposals, you have to build and maintain and expand relationships with community partners and all funders at all times. Um, I'm also working to advocate and message the district's vision, uh, priorities, successes, and areas for growth. And I keep abreast of the futuristic directions and challenges within pre-K um, to 16 educational systems, both at, I mean, at local, state, and national arenas. Um, things move fast and some funders um, want to see dynamic proposals. They want to see people who see where we're going. And so I'm always um, monitoring that to make sure that the, the um, work we're doing aligns with that vision. Um, and this is just a short list of the collaborative partners where I'm engaged in that relationship building and uh, co-creation process. You'll see UCSD up there, Cabrillo College, Kaiser Permanente, Digital Nest, 
Applied Survey Research, um, the Education Training Research Associates up in Scotts Valley, Second Harvest Food Bank, Life Lab, Santa Cruz County College Commitment, um, the Community Action Board, Community Foundation Santa Cruz County, uh, Pajaro Valley Health Trust again, and the South Towning Collaborative. And this is just a handful of the organizations with whom I um, talk and work on a regular basis. One example of what this collaborative um, landscape funding uh, uh, looks like is through Kaiser Community Benefit Program. So when I started in 2017, um, a call for proposal came up uh, in the spring, and we went after a $25,000 um, grant award that was funded to support the Healthy Start Centers, increasing the number of families and students they serve by adding on staff time. And then, um, following up on that, to build the relationship, we invited the head of community giving to come see our centers. And Dr. Rodriguez met with them, we met with Rich Puente, and they got to see firsthand and hear from our staff and see what we actually do. And lo and behold, about three months later, we got a call from the head of Kaiser. And he said, I really like what you guys are doing. I want to meet with the South County Housing Collaborative that you're a part of. And he gave a gift, an un um, asked for a gift to the group to continue the work of supporting fragile populations. Then about six months later, we got a call from Steve Wall and he said, I have a neat opportunity for a school district in my region, which is San Mateo down to Santa Cruz, for one school district to participate in the Alliance for a Healthier Generation program at no cost to you, and I want your district to have it if you'll take it. And so we did a call. And um, that initiative is being led this year at 10 sites under the leadership of April Aleman, one of our school nurses. Um, and then we applied for some funding to support activities at those sites this year. And Kaiser said, yes, we'll give you money to do that. So we leveraged the fact that we had a gift to secure more funding. And then finally, we got a call from Steve along with several community partners to do an invitation only grant application, which if you know anything about the grant world, that's kind of like your you know, money in the bank. Um, and that was $150,000, again, to a consortium here in South County that included us to support homeless children and families. So the relationship building piece of what I do is really a critical to our future success in serving our students, families, and community. And, and it's a part of the work that I truly love. Um, when I'm looking for this new funding, these are my guiding documents, which you all played a role, obviously, in creating. And so I wanted you to know that that's clearly on the front of my mind and always in conversations with Dr. Rodriguez. The target for student success, the LCAP goals, and the educational equity roadmap. And an example of what I mean by that's my focus, LCAP goal number three is visual and performing arts. LC STEM is a program that began in our district last year at Radcliffe Elementary. Again, when I started um, in 2017, I worked with Santa Cruz LC STEMA to apply to Monterey Peninsula Foundation for $20,000, which we received to support that effort. Um, and we maintain that relationship. They don't come and do visits, but uh, we've kept them abreast of, of the progress. And this year, we applied for 45 because we've expanded to a second school. Um, and they're very interested in continuing to fund us, and we're excited to see the success of the program. Um, and as part of, um, again, the collaboration, I work regularly with the Santa Cruz LC STEMA director on other grant opportunities where we cannot be the applicant because they don't fund a school district, but she can. And so we co-write things, we edit, and we are always finding ways to bring more funding to support the program, which again benefits our students. Um, and then this is a summary slide of past, current, and anticipated successes. So the total funding received since the start of my tenure, which was in March 2017, has been um, f about $5.5 million. During the calendar year of 2017, uh, we received eight grant awards for a total of almost $5 million. This, so this far in 2018, eight grant awards have been received to about 700 million and two of those with collaborative partners, which means either they were the lead or we just did it as a, a collaboration because that's what funders um, wanted in that instance. And then right now we have five that are submitted and pending, 
with a value of almost half a million dollars. And I have eight more uh, either concepts or applications in development right now, and three of those are with collaborative partners. And this is an example of when I say pending. So the National Science Foundation is a wonderful organization that funds a lot of innovative um, things in the arena of science. And we applied with some colleagues under the category Computer Science for All Researcher Practitioner Partnerships. And it was, um, our colleagues were ETR Associates, Digital Nest, Cabrillo College. And um, the title is a Coordinated Cross-Institutional Career and Technical Education Cybersecurity Pathway. We submitted in May, and we have been asked for additional documentation, and in fact, are now being recommended for funding. We just can't say we have the funds in hand yet, but that's um, um, exceptional. And it will bring $100,000 to our district. Um, uh, and it is really to build a CTE cybersecurity pathway for our students. Cybersecurity was once again in the news today. We know this is a growing and expanding um, job sector for our students, and we have a wonderful new um, uh, lecturer up at Cabrillo College in cybersecurity, and we're working very closely with him to develop this pathway for our students. So um, I think that was my last slide. Um, and just to say, it's an honor and a privilege every day to come to work um, with such enthusiastic and wonderful people, and, um, and your direction and guidance has been a part of that, and I'm thrilled to continue my work, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do we have any speakers? Nope. Okay. I see Willie leaning in. Go ahead, <laughs> Willie. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> All right. Can we, can we put a, our orders in now for <laughs> our favorite projects? Uh, I think Michelle will happily take your orders. <laughs> she is one of my best funnels for opportunities well, and direction. Yeah, the, the uh, state has had uh, funds for ETC uh, shops and middle shops and so forth. With this, with this program coming in as a requirement, we have an opportunity now to revamp the shop program at Watsonville High School, make them really functional like Salinas. And so this is a, but it, but the state had a huge grant amount of money that went to Arvin High School a, uh, a couple of years ago, and they, they completely rebuilt their entire program, so it's really outstanding. Mm -hmm. The second order, is, the second thing I like, is uh, Radcliffe School needs a all-purpose artificial turf field, mm -hmm. and if you can find some and grant money, we can, we can really put that wow. in. Make that happen. And the third thing that we need, <laughs> <laughs> we need a towel service for our <laughs> PE classes that we, kids don't shower because we don't have towels. It, that's a fact. And years ago, our PE classes were a lot more physical because kids had, had the ability to shower at the end of the day. Well, so, so if you don't have a towel, you don't shower, so you don't, you don't run as fast, you don't sweat. So anyway, that's, those are my th three things I'd love to do, love to have. Thank you. Drive. Thank you for your comments, and I'm sure Dr. Rodriguez will take them under advisement. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jeff? Fantastic job. Thank you. I saw you did 4.7 million in 2017. You did about 800,000 so far in 2018. We're nine months through the year. Did you have what? What's the, different? So we had the huge footsteps to brilliance matching fund grant that came in, which I continue to help manage. Um, How much and was so that? That was a 3.9. Okay, so the three point. So you have 4.7. Take away 3.9. So you have about 800,000. Yeah. So we're on track for a better year, taking away that. Yeah. Absolutely. Abnormality. Absolutely. Okay. What, do you, what do you think is a, is a realistic number for the board to ask or to expect hmm. on, a I think on a consistent basis? 800,000? Um, yeah, I think about that, maybe to a million. And then there will be those big whoppers that will come in. Part of it is there are grant opportunities out there, or I see things, and at times we are almost there because we're getting data about the success of our program. Right, we're almost there where I have a, a, a sensational story to tell to get funded, and sometimes I don't have 
a story that I know is going to earn us the points or get the visibility to be funded. And so I just keep those in my tickler for maybe next year we're ready. So like this year, we've seen the improvement in test scores. All of a sudden, there are new opportunities and places that I can start um, mm -hmm. fielding um, you know, grant uh, applications and relationships that I can nurture. Hey, we're on the move. Um, and so it's sort of a long-term thing. And what I would say is probably, probably about a million every year. But then again, every once in a while, watch out for me to be exceptional. <laughs> we already think you're exceptional. But I, you know, as, as the board moves forward, we will. As the board, we already think you're exceptional. Thank you. But as the board moves forward, I think it's nice to have a, a, a figure in our head. And you know, the 3.9 millions are going to come sometimes. That's great. Yeah. And some years you're going to get 500,000. I get yeah. it. But on a consistent basis, um, I think it's yeah. important for the board to keep in mind about a million dollars. About a million. Gets so we're getting, a ten, we're getting a that. 10 for one on you. Yeah, yeah. About All right. Around, and those okay. Numbers. Thank you. Well, I just loved hearing about how you think about how we're doing and how, how the stories come up about things that have happened here. Because I, you're totally right. You have to have something that you could tell a grant writer. <laughs> I mean, a grant writer. Uh, 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 whatever. Where you can get your grants, where you get your grants, grant funding place. Um, you need to be able to tell them these kind of stories that they could say, whoa, okay, well, that sounds really good that they've been able to accomplish this or do this or do that, whatever. So, so yeah, I, I really liked hearing about how you really, well, I'm so glad that you're so involved. <laughs> you're incredibly involved with our school district. And you have been able to figure out, you know, where that you can focus on based on what we've accomplished, what we're doing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. To be able to see, okay, yeah, yeah I, can, I can work there because we've done, you know, like this. We've done some stuff here, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So that's mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. Thank you. I do, that is the part I love. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Kim? Hi. Hi. So <clears throat> for all due disclosures, y you are a friend of mine. I'm very happy that you're in this position. Mm -hmm. I do grant writing myself over the years here and there, so I know how hard it is. When I put in the playground at Valencia, I think I wrote about 150 grants and maybe 40 of them funded. And it, every $2,500 that I got was like one in a jackpot. So I know how fun it is to hit them. So one of the requirements of grants, and I heard you say a little bit about it, um, is the monitoring and evaluation of the money because the funders expect to know how their money was used and what the outcomes were related to the goals that you presented to them. Correct. So that feels to me like a job in and of itself. And I know we've got some grants going into different departments where potentially directors or leads are managing, monitoring and evaluating, but so I guess I'd, maybe this is a good one for the superintendent. So if you could tell us more about that, because I know that we have to report back to funders, and that's a lot of work. Right. So that was actually one of the five positions that we added. So one of them was um, the grant writer. The second one was the teacher on special assignment that was there specifically in order to free up Francis and the department in order to be able to do program evaluation. So this summer, they were busily doing all the program evaluation work. So whether it was El Sistema, which allowed us to get the secondary grant that Andrea was speaking to, or the other things, um, we do have a full-time extra person that is in um, our um, research and accountability office um, to be able to do that work. That's great, because I know sometimes the, if we don't report back, then we're, we, we may not apply. We, we're not allowed to apply again for money, sometimes ever, sometimes for a certain period. Yeah. So, um, so that, I'm glad to know that. Um, I'm very happy to hear that you are working with ETR because I'm also on the board of ETR and it's an amazing organization and they know how to write for money. ETR is an organization that, um, it's a national organization, multi-million dollar organization that um, essentially produces evidence-based scientific curriculum in the areas of um, like harm reduction. So 
pregnancy prevention, um, HIV prevention, ST, STI prevention, tobacco cessation, drug use, alcohol, like anything that harms like the human being, essentially they're producing and researching ways to um, affect that in, in positive ways. So they are like um, a contractor with the federal government in many areas, like they are a preferred provider, so they're able to really pull down money and deliver curriculum to schools, to um, health clinics, um, public health, medical, it's an amazing organization. So yeah. that hopefully you guys will get that grant, that's great. I think we will, and I think yeah. there are more to come. That's becoming a very positive relationship, so I'm excited about that. So one of the things I'd like to put a plug in for, <laughs> thank you, Willie, <laughs> 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 and this is for all high schools, is that I have written in the past a grant for a grad night. The Monterey Peninsula Foundation provides, I think, 2,500 per school right. for grad nights, and I'd really like, and I don't want to have to write it again for Aptos High, but I think all schools, PV, Watsonville, Renaissance, anyone that has a grad night or wants to do a grad night is eligible to apply, so if they could have your help doing that, because I think that's an important use of the money. Um, and Andrea, if you could just t give us maybe two sentences about your background and your parents and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my dad, my dad is an anthropology professor who taught and retired from both UC Santa Barbara and CSUMB. Um, I'm actually a sixth generation Watsonvillian. I am part of the Wyckoff family, which um, settled here in the early 1800s. I was not raised here, but came back here when my parents relocated for my father's second tenure at CSUMB. I am a medical anthropologist by training, but have always worked in um, social service and justice oriented positions, whether it was at a human rights organization out of college or a medical ethics um, education program about the uh, rights of patients. And then I did a stint as a non-clinical um, hospital manager over five departments down at USC um, in Los Angeles. Um, so I have a pretty varied career, but it's always about um, organizations that care for um, human souls and improving um, their outcome when we have um, applied our service to them. And so that's sort of the strand in my life and um, this is exciting and fun work and I bring all those talents with me. And how many kids do you have? I have three. And they've gone through Pajaro uh, school? Two have gone through Pajaro and are at Cabrillo right now and I have a junior at Aptos High and I know you have a senior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Good, absolutely. good work. Thank you so much. Willie, did you have another? Yes, I'd like to just uh, say um, this, is, uh, this is another great example. When, 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 when we voted that night to, um, to uh, form the uh, grant writer position, uh, I got several phone calls during the day from friends who said, you don't hire any more people at the central office. You guys are building the central office and yada, yada, yada. And uh, so that we did it. But I, but I knew that I had people um, calling me that were really against adding people to the central office. Uh, Michelle's vision uh, and saw the need for this and uh, for this position and I can hardly wait till I phone these guys back and go, ha ha, we got five million dollars. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Maria? Thank everybody for that. Um, going back to uh, trustee suggestions, um, I'm very interested in perhaps bringing that back as a separate item and really looking at where the needs are in the district and how um, some of that funding can be allocated to fund improvements um, so a anything that's not uh, program specific out of the revenue received through the grants so I know that there's like the sistema that's a specific for that program but um, if there's um, sources of grants that are not program specific I think we should explore the option of where we want that to be invested yeah, we, we can most of the time, they are very program specific, but okay. um, 
I'll double check on that. On that, of all of them that I can think of, um, when we write the proposal, it slates the money for a particular area. Okay. It's um, I can't think of a time except for Chevron, probably. Um, so Chevron would be one where we received a small grant from them um, that wasn't slated. So okay. I'll investigate um, how if we have more off the top of my head. The stem, the Chevron stem zone, is the only one I can think of that's like that. But okay. we can um, bring that back on that one Great. and others that we have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I think we're lucky to have you. I remember when this came forward also, um, I, I believe Dr. Rodriguez said, this position will pay for itself. And, um, and congratulations on, on good work. And it's great for the district, good for our kids. Um, I really like the fact that it's, Michelle is using the grant dollars to increase student achievement which gives you more to go. I, I just love that. It's just, it's a cycle and um, it can continue to grow as our achievements grow too. So that's great. Um, so that was a um, report and discussion item. So um, no action. Thank you again for being here um, so late. Okay, congrats. Okay, item 9.2 is the summer school report. And this is by Carol Ortiz, our Director of Extended Learning. Hi, Carol. Thanks for, for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. They're very shy. Good evening, President DeRose, Superintendent Rodriguez, members of the board. I'm Carol Ortiz, Director of the Extended Learning Department. We oversee after school programs and summer school here in PBUSD. I'll be doing a brief presentation on our summer programs. And before I get started, I would like to acknowledge the two staff members who made it through the meeting and stayed because I had invited all my staff members, but everyone has things to do, right? Edgar Monjaras, right behind me, is our ingenuity guru for um, after school programs and for summer school. He's in charge of ensuring that the credit recovery ingenuity courses get along well and then summer school programs as well. He organizes all of the classrooms, um, works with the teachers, does the trainings. Isaiah Chavarria um, has been a staple of our after school programs as well for many years. He currently works at Lakeview after school program, but he also works with, uh, with us throughout the year preparing our um, curriculum boxes that we put together for the teachers for summer school. It's very labor intensive and it's very hands-on project-based uh, summer program. And he and another, a partner of his work, many, many months ordering all of the supplies, putting all the kits together by grade level. And I really appreciate that um, very physical manual work that he does. He delivers the curriculum out um, in June, picks it up in July, does inventory. I mean, he does a great job. So I just want to acknowledge not just the two that are here, but all of my staff who work hard year round to get our summer school programs going. Um, this is just a write up of uh, a quote from the National Center for After School and Summer Enrichment. We know that summer learning loss is, is um, a very great concern for not only our students and our community, but just across the United States. And this is kind of a guiding force for us as to why we have such a high high standard for our summer school program. Our program background is that we serve, during the school year, after school programs serve about 4,000 students every day. During summer, we serve approximately 2,700 students. Uh, our average daily attendance at our elementary and middle schools during the summer is 2,200 students. And at the high school, it's approximately 595 students. Our summer programs go for four weeks, um, four hours a day for the elementary and middle school six and a half hours a day for the high schools. Our high school students have the capability to get up, up to 10 credits of credit recovery during the summer. This is just a little example of what our classrooms look like. All of our curriculum is based around two very important curriculum um, content standards that we worked with 
some curriculum coaches, I would say about three, maybe four years ago, where we developed our summer school curriculum in-house based around uh, certain content standards that they felt were missing, um, that kids needed some reinforcement over the summer. We All of our, our curriculum during out for the elementary and middle school sites is based around science. So I know um, that students are get very engaged when there's anything science related, hands-on related. So we created our summer school curriculum based on that student need. This year, we did a partnership with the public libraries in Watsonville, Aptos, and La Selva Beach. Personally, remembering um, being a, a child in Watsonville, walking over to the public library down on Union Street and um, doing the summer reading program, and then walking across the street and getting a 50 cent hot dog from Taylor's there on the corner. Um, th the reading, the summer reading program was a critical part of my growing up. So I wanted to make sure our, our students were accessing the public library more than I think they have been in the past. In the, in the packet that I gave you, the actual report, not the slideshow, there's a quote from the public librarian who actually noticed uh, an increase in students getting their library cards this summer and signing up for their summer reading program. So I feel that, was, that partnership was a success and will definitely be continuing. Um, again, our summer school program is um, science-based. It's based around those, um, high those summer school principles or those extended learning principles of active mastery, support, collaboration, expanding their, their, um, envir their environment and making learning meaningful to them. This year we collaborated with an organization to bring a Lego STEAM camp to one of our schools as a pilot program. This Lego STEAM camp is offered at the Cabrillo summer youth um, workshops that they provide where students are charged $240 for a, for a four day workshop. We brought the exact same class to our students at H.A. Hyde. We had a separate class for two weeks for our K-3 students and then another class for two weeks for our four or five students. It is, was the exact same teacher, the same curriculum, same program, just um, offered to our students here in our district. And I was very proud of my staff that, that, um, were, um, that brought that to our um, department or our school district. And I'm hoping in the future that we could expand these types of camps to have more opportunities for more of our students who may not be able to um, have the funds to be in other type of summer camps that may be costly. This is just a quote from an article in the Register Paharonian regarding our, our um, physics bus that came and visited us. Uh, as you could read in the report, the physics bus came from, uh -oh, came from the East Coast and drove over, sorry, again, uh, our, our own, uh, our Jen Bruno, who works in our department, brought the physics bus over along with the Lego camp. This physics bus provided some hands-on um, NGSS activities to all of our students at the elementary and middle schools. They just drove around the different schools and had the kids go in and do some of the activities and then they did some outdoor activities. They partnered with um, the city of Watsonville to have some of the city of Watsonville staff from the science workshop uh, work with them as well at the site. So the students had opportunities to work with a variety of staff. And Michelle was actually able to get on that physics bus and do some of the activities herself over at H.A. Hyde. Um, there we go. These are just some examples of the community partnerships that we have during summer school. We have um, technology through actually ETR with a Watsonville Wetlands Watch, our own Fitness for Life, which is nutrition and health and cooking classes. Um, we have our new partnership with the Limpets, which is from the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History, and um, the resident artists there on the right side is that with the Spectra through Santa Cruz um, Arts Council. These are just some of our kids out um, doing our gardening here doing the limpets up there with the microscopes and then doing the, the Spectra Arts Council. They had to pretend to be animals and then the artist was teaching them how to express themselves without being able to talk. That one is at one of our school gardens, but it's the wetlands um, staff person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a picture of our students out doing our fitness and nutrition. Um, the one up on the top is the with the ETR that was a coding class at one of our middle schools. And then we also had drumming um, with the, again, with the Santa Cruz um, Arts Council. This is, was a new partnership for us. We brought in the Puppetry Institute to do some assemblies with our students. Um, again, to emphasize the A and the STEAM, we try to bring a lot of um, art opportunities for our students. Again, that something they may not have gotten an opportunity to go out and see in the community or you know see um, events. The on the left hand side is a presentation actually from our um, teacher, our binational teacher who comes over from the migrant department. Migrant partners with us during summer school along with special education to be able to provide summer opportunities for students. And migrant brings over a binational teacher, a credential teacher from Mexico who comes and works in our elementary classes, has their own classroom and pro provides a lot of cultural art and opportunities for students as part of summer school. Sorry. Our high school programs, we had three high school different high school programs going on this year. We had our regular credit recovery program, which is described there. Uh, again, students get to earn up to 10 credits uh, for credit recovery. The priority is for students who have received Fs, um, but we do allow students who have Ds who are just need to improve a grade to attend if we have space. This year, our credit recovery program was offered over at Aptos High School. We also piloted two programs this year with um, Michelle's encouragement and support um, the first one was Summer in the City, which was the internship program um, opportunity for 20 of our high school students to participate in an internship. They'll do a morning class with two school district teachers, focus, uh, classes focused on civil, um, civil learning, community relations, and then in the afternoon they went and did their internships. They went to the public library, to the airport, to the city offices, to the parks and recs. Um, so they were placed in um, many, oh, the fire department, they were placed in many different um, government offices throughout the summer. And um, in addition to receiving two and a half elective credits, they also qualified for $500 stipend through the city. The Digital Nest Partnership was, um, came about because we wanted to be able to have more of our students attending credit recovery participate in the, the Digital Nest um, classes that they provide, their workshops they provide. So we had um, two classes offered at Digital Nest. Two of our credential teachers um, were providing the credit recovery courses there at Digital Nest. Students had the, uh, took a break, had lunch, which was provided by the district as well. And then the students stayed for the workshops there at Digital Nest. So they were able to just um, fluently have their day all in one space instead of having to be transported back and forth. Two other pilots that happened, one was new this year, which is Elevate Math. Um, Pre-Math one, this is, was our second year doing that. Um, because we know that there's a large need for math preparation at the high school level, we try to op offer opportunities for students to prepare for math in eighth grade going into ninth grade. The Elevate Math class was offered over at Lakeview during, as part of the summer school. The teacher received training in a specialized curriculum and the students participated in, in that math class for the four weeks of summer school. The pre-math one class was offered over at Aptos High School. The students also um, received specific um, academic curriculum learning related to high school math preparation. These are just photos of the students who participated in the internship um, with the Summer in the City program. The, um, and the report that I gave you, there's actually some links where you can see their videos on YouTube. So there's testimonials of how the program impacted them. And a few of the students actually developed a um, PSA, public service announcement on getting out the vote. And you can see their work over in YouTube. Oh, there's that quote from the librarian. She was very happy with our collaboration. No, I'm sorry, that's a different librarian. This is the one about the internship. So these are the, this she just made that comment about the students who did their internship. She actually was one of the city members who did a presentation as part of the class um, to the internship students and this is just what she said about the students. Okay. They're just pictures of our students participating in the Summer at the Nest program. Oh, yeah, th at, at, at Digital Nest, but we called it Summer at the Nest, yeah. These are our high school 
summer grads who I'm very proud of. We had 19 students complete their credits and graduate this summer over at Aptos High School. Um, it, our, usually our summer um, ceremony is very intimate because there's such a small amount of students. We're able to really give the students individual attention. Uh, we had a student uh, do a sing a song. We had a student do a poem. Another student, a couple of students did a speech. And it's just so happy to see them fulfilling that last leg of their dream of getting, being able to get their diploma and then move on in the fall. Two other programs that we've um, been piloting over the last few years, the Jumpstart program has actually had actually been in place at Rolling Hills for quite a few years as part of the after school program. Um, that's a program for students going into middle school, into middle school, so from fifth to sixth grade. The Step Up to High School program is a program for students entering the ninth grade, so from eighth to ninth. Both programs are tailored specifically for the needs of the schools. The, um, the certificated staff kind of take the lead in terms of developing the curriculum. They invite the students, they talk to the parents, they do all of their recruitment. We provide, as you can see in that picture there, we provide some um, classroom materials. That's a Lakeview backpack there, so we give that to those incoming sixth graders so they can be prepared for school. Um, we, this pilot initially, like I said, started with after school program at um, funding at Rolling Hills, but over the last, I would say two or three years, we've partnered with um, state and federal programs to use Title I funding to provide the majority of um, the programs that you're seeing here. And it has just been an um, incredible partnership to be able to begin with some ideas that we have and just grow them and make them, make them better. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have any speakers to this item, but um, we'll open it up for board questions. Kim, go ahead. That was a great presentation. It's so exciting to see all the neat things happening and all the collaborations. I want to thank you for all the hard work and all your staff. You. I do have a question. In, in the very long ago past, we used to get presentations from, I think, your position. There is a gentleman in the position. Do you remember Joe that? Troutway. Joe Troutwine. Joe Troutwine. Troutwine. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, the giant grants used to get pulled down um, by this district to, mm -hmm. to operate extended learning, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Are we still getting those? Because yes. we would like to hear more about yes. that in the future. I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. actually. Um, these, all of the programs that you saw are either, which includes after school as well, are either funded by state, which is ACES funding, or federal, which is 21st century grants. Um, or now we're using Title I funding as well. But all of our programs, summer school and after school, are all grant funded. So we're, we're receiving every dollar that we're eligible for? Mm -hmm. There's nothing left on the table? Oh, definitely. definitely. I will never leave anything on the table. Yes, we'll go for everything after school related. And yeah. what's, what's the budget for your shop? Ed? Oh, my goodness. You can I knew Anna needed to be here for something. <laughs> she's the math, like she's the whiz. Helen. I mean, oh yeah, Helen. I mean, in the millions, I could tell you that for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. I can't say exactly okay. how much, but. Well, it'll yeah. come in the board backup next week. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other comments, Georgia? I, I just had a question um, because um, when you were talking about the credit, um, the 10 credit cap, Mm -hmm. um, that students can get mm -hmm. at Aptus High and at Digital Nest now. Mm -hmm. And I believe we're only f able to, if I recall, facilitate 40 students at Digital Nest. Was that about correct? Mm -hmm. um, what is the number of what you're seeing that the need is? Mm. Oh, my goodness. Um, we definitely do not have the capacity to support the need. I could guarantee you that. There, um, e even if we just... Um, you know, somehow mandated all the students who had Fs attend credit recovery, we, we wouldn't be able to support all of them. Um, we, yeah, the, the summer school, because the, the way the time is with the credits, that the, amount, the credits have to have, the students have to have a certain amount of hours in order to see the credits, and we really try to pack it in to, you know, four weeks, because that's kind of the four weeks that has been our, our traditional summer school program. It's really a lot for students. Um, it's a lot for students, and it's a lot for teachers to cram it all in. Um, so we've actually talked about, Susan and I had, and Michelle has mentioned expanding uh, summer school for the high school students, giving them longer time mm -hmm. and, letting, and allowing them to um, have more time to get their, receive their credits. 
but in addition though, um, trying to expand it staff-wise in order to support the student need is definitely another conversation because it's really hard, and I understand that it's really hard for teachers to want to work during the summer, especially doing something as intensive as, as credit. credit recovery at the high school level. Um, okay, well, and I appreciate you being transparent and honest that you don't really have that number. And I know that when this board had voted that in, because we were looking at this with digital nest being somewhat of a pilot program, which mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes it was, it was the first mm -hmm. year. Do you see a possibility of that being expanded to meet a need more so for more students in Watsonville so they're not having to track up to Aptos hmm. or at Watsonville High or mm -hmm. is it mm -hmm. possible to expand that collaboration mm -hmm. with Digital Nest oh, yeah. mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. next year to mm -hmm. see more? Mm -hmm. um, and my next question is how are you, how is the district and your department prioritizing these students that need the credit recovery? Are you looking at Seniors, are they the priority because mm -hmm. you're trying to, they're trying to get out the door? Mm -hmm. Or you, are we having like a kind of a catch them when they're freshmen maybe mm -hmm. and we see that there's an, there as a potential issue here? I mean, mm -hmm. where, how are you mm -hmm. prioritizing mm -hmm. or creating a balance with mm -hmm. that? Well, we definitely prioritize the seniors. Like we work really closely with, the, with our after school coordinator to work at the high schools to collaborate with the counselors at the high schools to keep track of those lists of students who will need credit recovery. I mean, as seniors, you would already, you, once they start their senior year, you will already know. Um, so if we can't get them to recover credits during the school year in our regular credit recovery program, they're already on the list for our summer school program. So they're definitely the priority. Um, and then it's really hard because you want to balance, like you're saying, because there's a need at all grade levels. So um, it's the Fs are the priority. Fs are priority. Seniors are the priority. And then juniors, because if, this, if we're able to figure out their schedule now, then once they're seniors, they'll be good to go. And it's kind of, you know, preventing the, the need in their senior year to c recover credits. And then from there, it's, it's really um, Just down the counselor, counselor recommendations by based on what, what they knew that the students need. I, I guess just, you know, the concern about, like, catching it. Mm -hmm. on. I, I totally mm -hmm. get there's just if you there's always a limited amount of resources and that limits the means of what you could do mm -hmm. but just that early on catch with mm -hmm. freshmen because you know then when that you know emotional part sets in and the discouragement mm -hmm. and then they're despaired and then well why should I try and I, I could just see that being yep. just a snowball I agree hill, so. and I really feel like we as a department if we can focus our resources on getting as many students the credit recovery during the school year, it would really help minimize the need for them to take summer school. Because as high school students, it's really hard to get them to go to summer school. They want to work. A lot of students want to work. They wanted to do the internship and things like that. Well, they'll have more opportunities. But if they're behind in credits, they kind of don't have that much option. So if we can focus on trying to get more options and opportunities during the school year, it's really better for the student. I, I, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and then I guess the only other I think that could come into play is trying to identify those students that may be at risk for not being that successful that freshman year of high school in the junior high level yes. and trying to address it at yes, that level before sure. they become a freshman mm -hmm, so they're mm -hmm. off to a road of success. Mm -hmm. Just it, my thoughts. Yeah, I think that has been part of the discussion with looking at the the early, early, early warning system mm -hmm. that has been discussed, I know with Michelle, with Susan, and I believe Francis Whitney has been part of that discussion. Like how can we keep track of students who need that support I mean, from eighth grade going into ninth, really, we could start looking at that. And then everyone who may involve in some type of support system for that student receive that alert or know that student's name or know, and then we be able to target those students into the supports we individually provide, be it extended learning, SELPA, migrant, student services, all of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Maria? Yeah, mm -hmm. so just um, to piggyback on what Georgia was saying, and I know that you were not present at that board meeting, but uh, Michelle did present on the uh, blueprint, and and that covered a great deal of interventions um, for the next three years that will be in place to address exactly um, those type of concerns. So I think it will be beneficial to, ma to maybe, I don't know, promote what we're actually doing a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, not only um, you know, during meetings, but also for the larger community to know that we are paying attention and and to what's not working in our district mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So do we have a program evaluation in place for after school programs? Um, mm -hmm. And if so, do we know what's working and what's not? Are we doing away with programs that are ineffective? Mm -hmm. um, and if we are, can we invest that additional funding in programs that are working like Digital Nest um, or among others? Yeah, so um, just real quick to go back to what you were saying with regarding the prevention and intervention. Um, a big piece on the equity audit is to revise our credit recovery and having students get that, make up that coursework during the year, however we structure that. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have a huge impact over the years in terms of the students at the end of the year needing this extra credit. So I'm really looking forward to us figuring out how that's going to work because it's going to have a very positive yeah, impact. Look at the transcripts and really realizing when students are falling right? behind. Right, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big one. Um, and then with regards to program evaluation, our department does do a biannual report to both state and federal re with regards to our um, student academic progress. Um, and then we also do, um, that's to the federal, so that's for the 21st century. And then statewide for our ACES grants, we do, um, to the CDE, we do uh, program evaluations. Um, we ask all of our coordinators to evaluate the progress of their programs, and we have to submit a report to the CDE every year. And, and then just in-house, we're always doing that um, plan, do, study, act kind of evaluation of like what are we doing in terms of a team and what's working at your site and what's not, and how are you partnering with your individual school needs because not every after school program offers the same base because some schools may need something different just depending on that. Um, so those reports are done and I just kind of do them and send them off and mm -hmm. I should probably give them to you guys, so yeah. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. wanna make sure that we're investing time and staff and money and programs that are working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I think that's something that maybe we need to take a closer look at. Mm -hmm. I think they, they mm -hmm. all look great, but mm -hmm. if data shows otherwise, mm -hmm. it can be a great program, but mm -hmm. if it's not benefiting students, then mm -hmm. maybe we should consider an alternative. Mm -hmm. And I know Francis had talked to me, um, it was in July, about evaluating one of the pilots, and um, it was a good conversation to have because it's specific data questions she had were things I hadn't thought about. So I started thinking, okay, how are we gonna be able to apply this to other things? Mm -hmm. And so she's gonna be the perfect person to be able to collaborate with on kind of doing a, a really standard evaluation of our programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you did mention was that not all students are guaranteed a spot, mm -hmm. right, for mm -hmm. programs that come mm -hmm. forward, not just credit recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so have we looked into partnerships with the city or county to see what they offer? Mm -hmm. um, just for summer school or after school or both? Both, uh -huh. like across the board. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have very extensive partnerships with like quite a few community organizations. Um, it, yeah, it's they're bringing in a lot of um, a lot of opportunities for our students, such as like the internship, um, the science workshop staff that comes in, uh, Wetlands Watch, um, Digital Nest this year. So. We do have a lot of different partnerships. I'm not, sh it, it does help add a few students, but if you look at the big picture in terms of our district needs, um, the funding that we get for after school and summer school um, is a very small percentage compared to like our entire district enrollment. It's like, you know, if you think on the average, whatever after school programs um, have funds for, you know, we might have a site that's really small, doesn't have much grant funding, um, and you know, can maybe support 100, 150 students. Um, another site maybe has enough grant funding for 250 students. So it really varies by site, by grant, by what has been grandfathered in over the years, grant-wise and not. And so there's a lot of different variables. So there's definitely not mm -hmm. that um, enrollment equity. So, so it seems like this is an area of need. So maybe that's something mm -hmm. that our grant writer can look into mm -hmm. for additional funding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I like, um, you, you, it looks like there's a lot of what you might call somewhat new programs. I mean, your Lego camp, mm -hmm. the Limpens program, is that somewhat new with the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History? Um, I, but, and, and so the programs are in just different schools. I mean, they're not spread out among schools, which is, would be great if they were spread out, but whatever. I mean, I can see what you're saying about the money and everything. 
But I, I love this one, the Education Technology Research ETR and Code.org, because I went to um, the, the workshop we went to in, in San Francisco that um, there's so much, there's so little work doing with st for students on computer science mm -hmm. and so on. And so computer science drives innovations throughout the U.S. economy and, you know, and um, it remains marginalized through K-12 education. So close the gap by using curriculum and activities from code.org to teach students computer science concept and coding, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is so critical, to be honest with you, to, for students to have this, you know, and, and, and where, where, where was, is, was this in just one school too? Yes, this one was um, our, with our partnership with ETR. They came and provided a coding class at the middle school. And during summer school, we only had one middle school program going. It was at Lakeview. So all of the middle school students attended Lakeview, and that class was offered there. Okay. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the students from the middle school could go and mm -hmm. get that code.org of it. Yeah, it seems so critical, you know, and so mm -hmm. there's that kind mm -hmm. of program, which we could do it more often during the year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, Rob Hoffman and I have talked about um, doing, bringing in a, an organization to do coding in after school. We've had, we've had it spotty here and there. It hasn't been consistent in after school, but that's something we, we would like to do at the middle school level. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a really critical report. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I didn't know that it, our after school or summer programs were so robust, so it's really good to hear that. And um, yeah, it would be great to serve every single student, mm -hmm. but I understand. But I think we can, you know, set some goals and get there eventually. Mm -hmm. So thank mm -hmm. you so much thank for you. that great presentation. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, so now we're to our consent agenda. Um, and before I ask for a motion, um, I just wanted to recognize a, um, a contribution of $5,000 from the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz. And I also wanted to ask if that could be reworded so uh, the name is um, in the right order. It's the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, not Santa Cruz County Community Foundation. I just feel like they give us so much um, through our collaborations that we should have their name right <laughs> on our agenda. Okay. Um, Leslie? Yes. Uh, I'd like to point out that I believe that was a donor advised grant from Roseanne Wolpert. Oh. If you remember, Bruce Wolpert was um, a watchdog on behalf of this district and wanted us to be the best we could be. Okay. Um, and so thank you to Roseanne um, for the $5,000 contribution. Thank you for pointing from your that out. Fund, yeah. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 7 0. Thank you. No deferred consent items. Uh, we do have a report out on closed session. Very and, nice. Um, there's quite a bit. <laughs> um, I don't think we have to vote on anything out here, correct? We don't. Okay, we're just reporting out and we're still within our time anyway. Um, so, With the Maria? exception of the first two items. Oh, okay. Under item um, 2.1, I move to approve the certificate of personnel as presented by the district administra administration with the addition of six new hires, two leave of absences, and three separations. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll abstain. Okay. Motion passes 610 with one abstention. Under item two point Trustee Acosta was enclosed. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry. Under item two point two, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of one promotion and one separation from service. Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. Thank and you. under those two uh, board items, the board per, uh, voted to promote uh, four new administrators. So congr congratulations to the following who have been who have served our students and district for several years. We have Clint uh, Brocker, Director of Administrative Services. 
He was promoted from Business Information and System Analyst. He has been with PBUSD since 2014 as a Business Information and System Analyst. He also worked at Soquel Elementary School, di Elementary District as an Administrative Assistant and as an IT Manager at the County Office. He has a bachelor's degree in history from UC Santa Cruz. At PBUSD, Klein has served on three district bargaining teams. When, when successful, multi-year agreements were finalized with all three labor groups, CSEA, PFT, and CWA. We also have Chris Harris, principal at Pajaro Valley Middle School, promoted from assistant principal, program coordinator at Lakeview Middle School. Chris is excited about re rejoining his Pajaro Middle School family where he can resume working relationships with staff to students' educational interest. In 2006, Chris began his career at PBUSD as a site coordinator and summer school curriculum coach of extended learning. He taught second and fourth grades PE teacher and served as an athletic director. He's also the, he was also the founder uh, of the Charter School Athletics Program. He received his associate's degree from Hartnell, a bachelor's degree from Cal State San Marcos, and a master's in educational leadership from Cal State East Bay. Um, in addition to that, we have Wendy Baltasar, now our assistant principal at Alianza Charter School. She was promoted from teacher at Alianza. Wendy has been a dedicated member of the Alianza community since 2014 when she began as a summer school teacher. She taught second, fifth, and seventh grade and took on a variety of educational leadership roles such as providing training to utilize an understanding by design, implementing the charter plan and two-way immersion recommendations and served on the Alianza Governance Council. And lastly, we have Heather Ann Bailey academic coordinator at Radcliffe, Radcliffe Elementary. She was promoted from the after school program coordinator at Freedom Elementary. Since 2016, Heather has been serving the educational needs of students as a second, second and third grade teacher and summer school principal. She has had extensive professional development experience including Bridges Math, Systematic ELD, Kate Kinsella, and CLAD. Heather received a bachelor's degree in science from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania and a master's in educational leadership from San Jose State. Congratulations all. <laughs> so now under item uh, 2.3 public employee discipline dismissals releases and leaves um, the board approved the settlement settlement agreement for a classified employee number 131 uh, with a 601 vote. Under item 2.9, the board um, approved a workers' compensation claim settlement with claim number 81060200098 with, with a 601 vote. Under item 2.10, the board ratify a workers' compensation claim for claim number 493406. Under item 211, um, the Board of Trustees ratified a workers' compensation claim with claim number 506143 with a, zero, with a 601 vote. Under item 2.12, the board ratified a workers' compensation claim with a claim number 514683. Under item 2.13, we also ratify a workers' compensation claim with claim number 534948. And um, under item 2.14, the board approve a settlement agreement for claim and damages with a 601 vote. And lastly, under item 2.15, the board ratify a workers' compensation claim for claim number 507443. Thank you, Maria. Wow, that was a long one. <laughs> that was like a marathon. Great job. Um, okay, item 14 is a upcoming board meetings. Our next meeting will be September 12th here in the district um, office boardroom. We'll have our unaudited actuals at that meeting. And then following that is uh, September 26th. And um, September 12th is also the groundbreaking 
for PVPSA too. So it'll be easy to remember. Um, and uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you for coming. Meetings adjourned.